empty in the front. Um, but um, good afternoon. I know this is right after lunch, uh, so I don't know how many of you are in the mood for this. Uh, I, I am certainly. I didn't have lunch because I want to keep myself awake. Um, but good to meet you. Uh, my name is Manu. Uh, I'm a strategic agency manager um, I, for Google. Basically, what that means is I work for some of the top tier agencies like Clixel, uh, and we support them on everything that they do. Uh, so thank you for having me. Uh, and um, when I was speaking with Dave, and I thought uh, I was going through the agenda as well, uh, this seems to be more like a digital crash course rather than uh, one said, rather than Elevate. And I was telling Shreyans as well, we should name this as a crash course. You've seen so many platforms uh, since yesterday. That's amazing that everyone has come together and uh, we've got a chance to present. Um, so from Google perspective, um, you know, the mandate given to me uh, was, uh, why don't we present something on Gen Z? And why don't we share how can Google platforms help reach the cohort? Uh, so that's what I want to cover. Just two simple bits. I know it's been a long day, uh, as I mentioned, after lunch. So we'll keep it simple. We'll speak about two things. One is, um, what's unique about Gen Z? And how can we reach them on Google? Or what can we do more on Google to engage with them? You guys can hear me properly, right? At the back as well? Awesome. OK, now, you know, just starting with a bit, I think um, one fourth of the population of the world is what I'm told is Gen Z. Um, and they're slightly different. Um, you know, there's been, uh, I don't think, enough attention given by marketers like yourself. Uh, to, to the fact on what needs to change when you engage with them. Uh, Gen Z as a cohort, we believe, is uh, far more perceptive, informed, and far more influential uh, than some of the other generations. And that makes it important for us to have that strategic shift uh, when we work with them. Importantly, they're, they're important today. We know they're influencers, they're purchasers of a large categories. But tomorrow, they're definitely going to be our consumers. Uh, which also means that uh, they're not just the next generation, uh, they're the next generation for your revenue as well. And that's why it's important to keep in context on what are the trends that they're following, what's unique about them. Uh, and from a business perspective, I think the, the, the most important thing we realize is that certain categories, they're right the buyers. So categories like beauty, accessories, uh, categories on mobiles, laptops, these are the ones where they're the purchasers. But there's a significant portion of categories where they're directly the influencers. And we did some research internally, and we found right from tech to automobiles uh, to apparels, they hold significant influence in their home in terms of the decision that's made. Um, I know somebody uh, who was pushed by whether it was Zenji's son to buy a certain car. Uh, it wasn't a decision uh, both parents loved, but then uh, that's how it is. You know, and they say one in three Gen Z are really the purchasers as well. So there's significant amount of new uh, cohort of buyers coming in, which are Gen Z and getting into newer categories. Like I mentioned, accessories, laptops, uh, beauty are some of the major ones. And importantly, some of the older Gen Zs, uh, they would be touching 30 or at late 20s now. Uh, again, we did some kind of a research and we found that a significant portion of them are actually no more students. Um, in fact, 50% of them are now working, and about 30% of them are, in fact, working at senior and mid-levels in some of the larger organizations as well. So this means that they are transitioning towards just being influencers to actually being purchasers. But how do we define um, the differences between, let's say, a millennial and a Gen Z? You know, I find it very difficult to say that, okay, if you're born in 97, you probably have X characteristics, and if you're born in 93, you probably have different. Uh, but you know, just for simplicity's sake, if we have to define these two cohorts, we found four key differences when we looked at them. The first is we found Gen, Gen Z are more authentic in terms of, and rather than more aspirational, which we see millennials to be. Uh, my personal guess is that's because they've had more experiences, they've had more exposure. They've been more tech-led uh, since the time they've been born. So that gives them to be more authentic rather than aspirational. And I think the image on the right kind of captures it well. This is where we are moving from aspirational to authentic. On a behaviors wise, again, because of more exposure, because of the tech that they've been shown, they've been more pragmatic than idealistic, uh, which many of the millennials uh, would kind of consider themselves to be. 
And on communication, no surprises. They're more visual than uh, evolved text. Uh, I know in our office, uh, we have a lot of Gen Zs, um, and they never read. Uh, uh, for some of us, uh, we always want things to read and really just go through, uh, but they're the ones who would look at it visually and really just grasp far more. And brand expectations are slightly different. We've always been speaking about storytelling, but for them, it's relatable content. It's story living. It's how does it relate to them? What is it in for them? And how do they connect to it? That's more important. Uh, but for some of the millennials, we've seen that how does the story by itself plays uh, is a very important aspect. So what does it mean for brands? Um, you know, certain stereotypings we have seen usually happen, right? Now, one of the stereo, oh, I'm sorry, I was blocking this, I didn't know. Um, one of the stereo, I'll come that side. One of the stereotypes that we've seen kind of come through um, is that we feel Gen Z is to, to have more instant gratification. I, uh, you know, they buy things quickly, so we need more instant gratification. That's been one of the uh, stereotypes that we've seen come around with Gen Z. Frankly, I think instant gratification is a vice that uh, not just Gen Z's, but a lot of us struggle with. Uh, funnily, including my mom, who got a side chair yesterday, which we didn't need, uh, we had no space for, but she found it interesting and she found it on a discount, so she got, went ahead and bought it. Uh, so, you know, instant gratification is probably not something that's just related to Gen Z. But in fact, we felt that a certain cohort for things that they value, they go far more deep in research. And for things that are not as important, they're far more quick in terms of buying them. Hard to reach, too distracted. Um, again, uh, uh, attention span is less. Again, I think one of the aspects that just does not relate to Gen Z. Uh, all of us in this room, and I'll see probably after 15 minutes uh, what's the attention that we have, but all of us are struggling with the attention with so much of noise and chaos that's happening around. So not just related to Gen Z. In fact, storytelling and, like I said, story living has been very important for them. And they've been doing this via figuring out more things, understanding more. So in fact, that's not the case, that their attention gap is definitely lower for some aspects which are not important. But for the ones that are important, long form of storytelling on YouTube, as we've seen, makes a lot of sense for them. Tech dependent, avoid face-to-face -face interactions. They've been brought up in a world of um, social media, we feel. Uh, less of face-to-face -face interaction works for them. Dave is, where is Dave? Um, Dave is not here, but Dave has been very keen on always saying that uh, he's very interested in O2O solutions, online to offline solutions. Um, and in fact, it holds true for Gen Z. We've seen it work very well, that they've seen engagements come through, not just on one platform, but really lead up to uh, both online and offline. And not loyal to brands, trying something new every time, uh, but we've seen in our experiences and we've seen via storytelling and some of the excellent ads that brand marketers have created that Gen Z are in fact very loyal to brands that they relate to. Um, they stick on to brands where in the cliche sense they understand the why and they understand the reason for how it relates to them and they continue to stick with those brands. That doesn't mean that they don't experiment, but loyalty is something that's very unique to them. Importantly, I think that's a separate slide, is uh, as much as loyalty is important, we found credibility to be important. Um, we did this research and we said out of these parameters, which ones are the ones that would make you lead to purchase a thing? Um, mine was probably highest on coupons and discounts, but a lot of Gen Zs would also say that, but they'll also say that comments, reviews, likes on platforms would make a lot of sense before they kind of uh, go ahead and take a decision. So authentic, pragmatic, relatable, and story living is something that connects very well. Why do I emphasize this? This is because this will hold true on our platforms as well. And this is important for you as marketers to make sure that when you go ahead and create your campaigns and creatives, you consider these aspects into consideration. OK, so that's the first bit. That's about Gen Z. right? We've understood a few things about them. We've tried to say certain stereotypes. And we've obviously understand that there is probably a strategic shift uh, that as marketers we need to take while we deal with that. Where can YouTube and where can, where can Google come into play? Um, you know, we are very, uh, I, I think uh, when I was preparing through this deck and I was thinking on what we need to share about, um, I think we are most proud of how YouTube plays a part in connecting with the audience and not just Gen Zs, but in fact all of us. Uh, 
you know, we have a small video uh, which really just tries to show how does it connect to all of it. It's a one minute video, I wanna play this. It'll play it for Yeah. <laughs> Life is crazy. It's fantastic. Never like if I go to Never stop dreaming. Yeah, interesting, right? Um, I think when we, when, we, when we look back, and I think what makes me proud is when we look at the platform, we look at three different aspects, content, creation, creators. Uh, that's what makes it unique. You have varied amount of content, like we mentioned, music, sports, gaming, learning, entertainment, everything. Uh, and that's what people come to YouTube for. Um, you have great creators, which has been one of the key reasons that it connects with a generation like Gen Z, which want more authentic and real uh, relationships. And it has more choices for what you want to see, where you want to see, which platform do you want to see it, which surface do you want to see it, whether you want to see the long form content, whether you want to see a 15 hour live stream or a one hour long form video or a 10 second shots. Right, and this translates to what we say, right? 73% of Gen Zs come to YouTube. They, they, they watch it daily, and in fact, um, we asked about a certain set of Gen Zs, and 80% of them said that every time they hear of video, uh, YouTube is the one that comes to their mind first. But when we think of engaging with them, um, this is where we wanted simplification. Uh, you know, we, we spoke about the choices, right? Um, and sometimes the problem is choice, as somebody said. Uh, you have too many surfaces, you have too many formats, you have too many different type of contents, and you have too many platforms. Uh, how do you engage with a generation that's been split and probably spoiled for choices? Uh, we wanted to keep it simple. So we said, okay, uh, with everything that's happening around, let's try to keep the funnel simple now. And what makes us do this? Uh, no surprises. Um, uh, we've been speaking AI far too many times, and I think that plays into our ads front as well. AI has been one of the reasons that we've been able to make our products far simpler, and as marketers, for you to use them far easy. Uh, what, is, what do we look at when we say AI, and specifically from an from a engagement perspective on YouTube? We're saying a few different things. Some of, the, uh, some of the parameters or some of the inputs that are make, forming our strategy are now whether the person, which device the person is on, what's the bid that you've set, how is your creative kind of play, played role, what's the quality of your creative, uh, are the, are, is the person, how has the person been engaging with different ads, have they been seeing different ads, what time of the day are they looking at, what device are they looking at. These are aspects which have all come together to really just form our new formats that we've launched in the last six months, fundamentally on the basis of AI. And we feel that this really drives efficiencies for you as marketers. So let's keep it simple. I'll focus basically on awareness, consideration, and then we'll speak about a few very special properties that we feel uh, make a lot of difference. We will not touch upon performance. We don't want you to uh, leave you with too many things. So just two things. We we'll leave about awareness, consideration, and some of the uh, so other properties. Now on the awareness side, considering on the back of what I just said, everything related under the hood of AI for giving inputs to our, uh, giving input to our campaigns, we have something called 
called as video reach campaigns. Anybody, if you've heard of it, or we have pitched it to you, has anybody shared it? Maybe a quick show of hands. Nobody has see, heard of video reach campaigns? Okay, so video reach campaigns basically, what it does, it combines three formats. You use the in-stream, bumpers, non-skip. Um, in-stream is something that runs within the video. Bumpers is a six second. Uh, you also have non-skips, and you have shots, uh, which is personally my favorite. And then all of it really combines to make sure that you're uh, moving towards the highest reach that's possible at the lowest cost. And this has shown us results. 54% uh, unique, more, more unique reach uh, at 42% lower CPMs. So if your objective is to reach more Gen Zs, uh, if your objective is to make sure of driving more awareness, think of video reach campaigns. Uh, and think of it in a way that will drive more efficiencies when you drive more upper funnel uh, KPIs. I think it'll be simple for us to remember. Video reach campaigns, consider nobody had heard of it. Yeah? Okay, perfect. Now, on the consideration side, this is interesting, right? Now, think back on what we, what we discussed about Gen Zs. We said that they have, they've been always tech-led. They're more pragmatic. Um, they're, they're the ones who look for more connection, and they want to be more authentic. And because they have always been in a world where they've always had enough of knowledge, they do spend a lot of time in this middle phase, which we call as the messy middle. Uh, it's a very interesting for a long time. So for us, the journey which looks on the left uh, historically, or what we feel, um, is actually on the right, where we see not just Gen Zs, but most consumers spending a lot of time on exploration and evaluation. And as marketers, when we miss out on this phase, we really break our journey either from awareness to reaching to purchase. And in fact, if you ask me, uh, this is the most important journey in the whole of the funnel, because this is where people spend the most amount of time, specifically for purchases which are important, uh, specifically for engagements which are key for them. So what do we do for consideration? Two solutions. Right, so we had video reach campaigns, we have video view campaigns. Um, very simple to video reach campaigns, very similar to video reach campaigns. What does video view campaigns do? They make sure that you get better views, higher views at lower cost. And then they combine some of our formats. They use our in-stream. Again, they use shorts. And they use in-feed. In-feed is when you scroll on YouTube and you see videos come through there. So they make sure that, again, via the combination of everything that I spoke about, AI and under the hood that's working, video view campaigns make sure that you get 40% more views at 30% lower CPVs. OK. Maybe a pause there. Video reach campaigns, video view campaigns. Does that stick with you? Yeah? I think the attention gap is probably showing us a that. I didn't hear a yes here. Yeah? OK, awesome. Um, OK, so consideration, like I said, the consideration for us is definitely important. And I said, for, uh, for me, as I've seen in my experience, a phase that really drives between great campaigns and excellent campaigns. Now, consideration has two solutions, basically. So one was video view campaigns, where we said that we use AI to make sure that you're getting the best views. But we also do demand gen. Now, demand gen slightly goes a little lower funnel than, let's say, just 10 views. What does demand gen do? Demand gen combines what we spoke about in video view. But in addition, it not just adds video assets, it also adds image assets. And it looks for conversions like site visits, concentration lift, things which are more deeper in the funnel. And this is important, and this is in conjunction to, let's say, the whole funnel that we're looking at. You do the reach campaigns, make sure people are aware. You do the video view campaigns, make sure they're engaging. And you do demand gen to make sure they're engaging in a deeper way. They're coming to your sites, they're clicking on your ads, they're filling up forms. And these are tailored experiences. Demand gen has been the newest kid on our block for us. It's, it's, the, it's the more, uh, more evolved of the high, uh, AI that we've been using. And in three ways, basically. One is it uses shots, and it uses basically a format which makes you reach 3 billion people. Um, interestingly, we, we, I, I know nobody in the room wants to reach 3 billion people, while that's the potential. But it also helps you, make you reach out to the right audiences that you're looking at. And for the first time, we have something called as lookalike audiences, very different to what similar audiences we used to have in the past. But it is the one that makes you sure that you're reaching out to the right audiences. Basically, it's the data that you feed into the system. So you give us the first party data, and our systems are able to replicate that in terms of lookalike audiences. 
And like I said, it's more deep funnel, right? It works for conversions, it works for clicks. It makes sure that you're tracking site visits. The measurement aspect of demand gen makes sure that you're really just solving for that evaluation exploration phase where most consumers get stuck in. But you know, Dave has always been mentioning measurement has been very important. Dave, I'm just looking for you, and I think uh, I mentioned on the online, offline, but yeah, so, um, uh, you know, measurement is always important for when we say awareness and consideration. Many of us uh, do not have KPIs that really co correlate to them, and I see that to be a big gap, right? But it's for you to really just go back and see that for a generation which has been shifting, which you have said to be a generation that moves and shuffles and has less attention gap, where storytelling is important, engagement is critical, it's very important to have consideration and awareness. It is the important part in the problem that needs to be solved for. And when you look at measurement, we look at across the funnel. So when you're doing reach, you look at reach, frequency, CPMs. That should be the metrics and benchmarking it to the, your industry, your vertical, your previous campaigns should be, the, should be the KPI that you should be working for. Similarly, on consideration, again, one of my favorite phases, like I said, brand lift, cost per lifted user, consideration lift, site visits. These are metrics where it show that you've been engaging with customers and really pushing your brand in, which will further lead to sales down the line. So that's about on the awareness consideration. I'll repeat myself. Video reach for reaching the maximum users. Video view for engaging with users. Demand gen for moving them down the funnel and making sure that you're solving for the exploratory and the expand exploratory phase. But what's more? What's, what's the special thing that we have? You know, I think the, the, if you ask me one thing which, uh, you know, you probably say that, okay, Manu, what's one thing that you want to leave us with today? Um, and for me, that would be shots. Um, it's been a story that's been there for long. And it's something that we're seeing change the ecosystem, and not just from an ad side, but from a consumption side. And why is that? You know, it's a very interesting story. Um, when, when TikTok came in India, and when we had the reels and the shots come through, I was very intrigued, personally. Um, I, I couldn't really understand. I thought these are just short videos, probably vertical and not horizontal. But what makes them so special that you have entire platforms who are now booming and growing so well? And the shorts and sense kind of has done so well for everyone in that sense. Why is it making so much sense with consumers? I was very intrigued for a long time, and in fact, somebody explained it to me what's the reason. Now, think about it in two different ways. What shorts does, or what short form video does, it really changes things on both distribution and it changes things on consumption. What do I mean by that? 100 years ago, when we only had cinemas in the world, you had proper professional cameras that you needed to create content. At the right time, at the right location to go ahead and see, see those uh, content that was created. Next came television. It changed the way you looked at content. You could see it at your time at the comfort of your home. That changed the consumption side, but it didn't change the distribution side. You still needed professional cameras. You still had content. You had so much of inventory that you could fill. So what went next? You had platforms like YouTube, Netflix coming over. In fact, YouTube was a great example of how it changed both consumption and distribution. Now you didn't need professional cameras. You could do it. And of course, the consumption changed. You could say what you wanted to look at, what kind of content you wanted to see, at what time do you wanted to see, where you wanted to see, what device you wanted to see. And we thought that we were done at that time. But look what Shorts has done. It has, in fact, gone ahead and changed both consumption and distribution again. And that's why we feel it's such a big revolution. It's changed distribution because even the content creators who were not YouTube savvy, for example, are now able to come on the platform. You do not need a perfect setting. You do not need a long story. You sometimes need just moments to fill in. And that's where the, the, uh, the distribution side has changed. And on the consumption, I mean, if you think of the, how many of, think, how, how many of us have seen that experiment where, you, where a professor takes a jar and puts in golf balls and says that if this is your life, then there's so much space. But think about a day like that as well, right? You have a jar and you have moments like these when we are when we are sitting and talking, you will have time for work. But there are always going to be these little spaces or these little moments that you want to fill in with some entertainment. And you probably can't see a long form content there. You probably can't go to what you like and really read it in detail. And that's why short form really plays a lot of part. 
And that's why, because of this aspect, we really feel that this is a revolution, in fact, a step change in what video has changed. And that's why I would strongly recommend to look at short form video when you look through. So summary, what does it mean? It means you've got more creators. It means you've got more choices because you're bringing in more creators who are doing more things about their lives, which brings in more choices, and it brings in more content. And it's been doing very well uh, for us on the numbers side. We have 75 billion views daily, and we have 2 billion people logged into YouTube on watching shots. And on India's side, there's a very latest stats. Uh, the numbers have been even more staggering. Uh, there's been 30% increase in the people logging into YouTube shots, and there's a 120% increase in terms of the shots daily views. Significant numbers for the scale that we work at, this numbers to be increasing at that size. And I can assure you that our ad advertisers, we still have the challenge where the inventory is not enough. Uh, we've had advertisers just in the last week where they've looked at wanted to do some shorts campaign, but we haven't had the enough inventory. So how do we advertise on shorts? How do we make sure that we're using the, this, this big opportunity that has come over? First, what are ads on shorts? So between two organic content, you have an ad which comes in which is either six seconds to 60 seconds. It can, in fact, go longer than 60 seconds, but that will play on your channel. Uh, this, is a, this is an ad which will loop wide, will get into a loop unless being swiped up. And if you swipe down, the ad will come back again. So that's basically the ads on shorts. And it's, of course, the UI has changed in a way that it leads to more engagement, more conversions. What's important on shorts is, um, uh, you know, I'm not a fan of too, uh, too many things on the slides, but I wanted to confuse you and intentionally done this. But, um, uh, you know, the, the, the reason only to do this is to say that shorts plays a critical part in all our campaigns now. And so, you know, don't go into the nitty gritty. It plays a definite part in all our. So we, we spoke about video reach campaigns, which is basically reach and awareness. Shorts is a part of all of those campaigns. We spoke about consideration, video, uh, video view campaigns and demand gen, shorts play a part there. And we spoke about, we didn't speak about the lower funnel, but for, for those of you who are using it, shorts again play a big part there. We have something interesting which we call as the first spot on slots, which, which just really means that every time a user opens YouTube shorts, uh, or he opens a YouTube app and lands on the shorts uh, tab, the first ad will be yours. This is a kind of an impact property similar to what we have as a masthead, which is the front page of YouTube in a way. Uh, this really is an impact property which we've recently come to India, uh, and people have been using it in a good way. So two, two takeaways from the shorts aspect. One, um, like I said, firstly, this is, the, this is something that I've been very, very uh, excited about, and we've seen great results come in. But this has just started. So what do we need to do for this? One is shorts play a part in all your campaigns. So when you think of creative strategies and when you work with your creative folks, always think of vertical assets. Think of vertical assets which tell a story between six and 60 seconds. A vertical assets, when it's speaking to a Gen Z, comes across as engaging, make sure it's authentic and make sure it's relatable in a way. Uh, but having a vertical asset is very critical. The other point is we have a lot of campaigns which are shorts only. So when you think of strategies to build in more engagement, when you want to build in more, uh, more engagement with the Gen Zs and the population that you feel and want to use this opportunity, think of shorts only campaigns. Uh, we've seen that do very well as well. And we have a lot of new things coming up in 2024 on that. So that's something we'll be very excited to speak, you with, speak to you about. All right, what's the next one? Um, Pretty obvious, right? Something, uh, uh, it's, it's a favorite of Shubh, he mentioned a couple of times to me. Uh, uh, influencer marketing, right? I think, um, and it just relates to everything we spoke till now, right? So let's take a step back. We spoke about the distribution side and we said distribution has changed on YouTube because you have creators coming, right? We spoke on the Gen Z bit and we spoke how they're looking for authentic relationships. We spoke on the Gen Z bit that they're authentic and not aspirational. They wanna make sure that they're pragmatic and they're are relatable to the content that they're watching. And who does that better than uh, creators and, uh, or, or lack of the better word, influencers on YouTube? You know, this is a real story. We, we usually, when we make decks, we take in, we kind of assume a lot of uh, stories, but this is actually a real story of somebody. We are looking for the match highlights. Um, somewhere show a short video on um, uh, shoes, got interested, did some search on YouTube again, and actually did a journey and made a search and actually went ahead and purchased. 
Uh, very interesting, very simple, but really just captures how, what a role does influencer play in all of this? And what does the role that the mo right video at the right time to the right audience sometimes make a, makes a difference too? But what, what's about creators that we're so excited about? Uh, that, you know, in all my simplification that I wanted to do this deck for, uh, you know, I thought we'll keep the clean influence a bit here. So three things, you know, we've seen numbers to do very well. Um, awareness has been 96% every time a, uh, a YouTube creator kind of does that. And we see significant numbers come in in building confidence and making sure that they're influencing decisions. And creators is, of course, again, going back to the specifics of Gen Z, are ones that making it authentic in terms of relationship. It also makes a difference in terms of content because creators are not just on one. In fact, uh, do we want to take a guess, maybe a quick question, and uh, they will hand over a prize to somebody who gets it right, which is, uh, what, is the, um, what is the most category do you think Gen Zs look at out of the, out of the ones that we have here? What do we have, Dave, uh, for the prize? Mm. Very nice print chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one on the, on the quick, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Which, which category do we feel? Uh, I'm so surprised. All of you are wrong. It's music. You know, it's, and it's music by a large margin. We can't show the numbers here. No, oh, you said? It was misleading. It was the obvious choice, and they didn't keep you surprised. No, but somebody has got a lint chocolate there, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, you know, it's, it's music, and it's by a large, large margin, right? So. Um, is there a trend indicated? Is it YouTube music or just music? Music as a category, right? So, so that's what I'm saying. Look. Um, uh, and you know, the, I mean, if we could show the numbers in terms of the difference it has between comedy, gaming, and music, you'll be surprised how big music it is for, for the Generation G in terms of uh, uh, numbers. So it's exciting how sometimes our assumptions and intuitions are not probably uh, what the data shows us. And think about, you know, this was very interesting when we, when we thought about it in this way. You look at the funnel, you, you say, okay, let me have my content related to the funnel. You look at the funnel and you say, let me have my formats according to the funnel. But interesting, can you look at the creators and say, can I have them as per the funnel as well? And we feel you can. So why don't you have, you know, why don't you work with creators or think about working with creators who have, let's say, less than one million uh, subscribers or less than one million uh, users on that channel and think of more engagement with them. Think of more direct, consider think of more direct uh, conversion-led activities with them. Think about the ones between 10 million and 1 million. These could be the mid funnel for you. This is where you build in consideration. This is where you drive things for people who already know you. This is where you find creators who are highly relatable. And then 10 million plus, which again does the upper funnel for you. Think about the ones where you want to use the reach and awareness and drive that with them. I think there was a question sometime back to us. Uh, that's great. You have a lot of influencers. You have a lot of creators. Interestingly, we paid. As a, as a number, about $50 billion to creators and to, uh, to content creators on YouTube over the three year, past three years. It's a significant number, and it's growing as we, every year. But how do we engage with creators? How do we make sure that we're working with creators in a way that's solving for our KPIs? Again, we wanted to do it as per the funnel. I think the funnel is the best way we think about it. Helps us simplify. So three different things. Let's start with the... Um, uh, you know, the bottom of the funnel. And let me, let me be uh, on, a, on a lighter note. The funnel also says the cost. So the lower one is the, is the cheapest option, and it goes costly up as we go up. Um, so Google lineups and moments, right? Um, what is lineups and moments? Uh, very simply put, you have, we have created packs to say that if you're looking to target Gen Z and you believe music is a category that does relates very well. We've created the top 300 channels for you on YouTube. Use that, share it with the team, and they will run a campaign which is dynamic, which, which is simple to run, and you're running on the top, top contents on music. You can do this for gaming, you can do this for music, you can do this for uh, comedy, you can do this for all categories. We've made those packs, and you can use them. And we will also give you insights when you say about your audience to say, OK, this is your audience. This is what they're interested in. Why don't we create a PAX? That's what we call Google lineups. We've created specific PAX, and you can use them to kind of work when you, use, when you want to use the power of influencers. As you go up, you have content creations. What is content integrations? It's simply 
we help you find, uh, it's a very new thing that started at Google's end, we help you find creators who are out there in the market, across the funnel, under one million, one to 10 and 10 plus, basis the, basis the brief that you give us. We tell you, okay, let's work with these creators, let's think about these integrations, and let's make sure that we're able to take them across our platforms. This has been a very new thing, and it's we have worked very well. We have some examples on how um, uh, ET has probably uh, how ET has used it, and they've seen great results come in. And of course, like I said, the most expensive and the top of the funnel um, is of course the tent pole events, which is that you work with creators, create something which is interesting. Um, we've done that in the past, but it's something that's integrated. You've built in; it's very tailored, um, and of course needs a uh, deeper thought to it. So I was speaking about lineups. This is an example of a lineup. For example, I mean, this is what we kind of capture. It has a buying flexibility. You do it via Google Ads dashboard. You do it at your end. You make sure you know what, what is the reach, what is the CPM that you're targeting, and you make sure that you're able to get through that. This is the lineup on Gen Z that we had, um, you know, which I wanted to show you guys. And this is specifically we created for Gen Z. Uh, again, some of the top 300 channels that we feel Gen Zs are using, can you go ahead and target them? And these are some of the other lineups that we have across the segments of uh, different uh, consumer segments. This is what I was speaking to you about. Um, you give us a brief, we will tell you uh, which are the creators that you can work with, what kind of integrations can you work with, and then we will help you expand that in terms of marketing through Google platforms. It's, it's something that you usually do with uh, the external agencies in terms of figuring out talent, and we have partners who do this. So Google does not do this. We have partnerships with some of the external agencies. Uh, but the benefit is, of course, that uh, we come back with niche -er, some of the not so well-known but interesting creators who are coming up the segment, and we make sure that this happens with partners who gives you the right deal. This was the example I was speaking about. So ET Money uh, went ahead. Uh, they did two things. They worked with creators to speak about how can you, you save tax and they went ahead and took 100% sponsorships on some of the lineups that I spoke about. The result was 160% increase in search queries and 22 million reach at target frequency of four. Excellent results and something which has just been come up. And the last bit is, of course, CTV. Um, again, a very interesting bit. Uh, we've seen exponential rise in CTV on YouTube being uh, streamed on CTV. In fact, 60 million people, is a, it's a slightly dated number, 60 million people have been using CTV, and it's about 20 minutes or more that an average session lasts through. Um, CTV is an, is an interesting proposition that really combines with shorts, again, with content that you wanna look through, long-form content, engaging content on a screen which is new and which is growing as well. We have, again, some of these sponsorships. These are tailored, bespoke, which comes in, this is moments, basically, which come in during the year. Uh, which again you can utilize in terms of when they come up. We have a uh, number of them come up. Uh, again, we share these details. But these are great moments to use these. It's very similar to when you buy on TV and you say an impact property. Uh, this, is, this is one of those and you can use them. That's about it. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I was wrong probably. I've, you've been a great audience, very attentive. Uh, thank you for having me and uh, thank you, Dave. Uh, I, yeah, and I think, uh, I look forward to the rest of the sessions at Religious Learning for you. I'll be around uh, if there's any discussions we want to have. Uh, but thank you once again. Yeah? Thank you. Thank you. by Google. I'd also like to tell you that uh, Google helps brands uh, expand internationally as well. So they have a program called IGAP, uh, which essentially helps brands if they are looking to go, or go beyond their borders and want to expand. Then they have a curated list of services that they can provide. Uh, we are one of their uh, IGAP partners globally, and uh, we will be doing a follow-up session with Google on IGAP. Yeah, yeah. You want to? Yeah. Okay, so uh, on a very separate lens, um, we, uh, we have a, 
consultative arm, basically, that we started where we help brands go international. Uh, what we do, and this is not just from an ad perspective, this is from a logistics, payments, uh, customer service. We're able to help you with uh, consultative inputs across all of them. It's a very special, uh, and like I mentioned, Dave and his team have been uh, one of our very, very special partners, and we've extended it to them. Um, we were thinking of doing a very similar kind of a, a session where we, where we have you, and of course, we can come over and share what we do. How can we help you go overseas, expand to new geographies? And in, if you're already doing that, um, how can you make most of it via new uh, marketing initiatives? We plan to do this in February. Um, we're still figuring out dates. We have folks come in from um, other APAC markets for us to really uh, bring in our um, uh, expertise uh, from a global perspective. Uh, so once we have the dates, but in February is when we're looking at, and uh, like this one, we hope uh, that'll be great as well. So uh, we look forward. Um, Okay, so I am back, guys. I hope the lunch was really good. Yeah? <laughs> okay, so uh, before I start with another question, I, I, I would like to take a selfie. I hope that's not a problem, okay? Give me your best smiles, smiles please. So this is the uh, filter we created for the uh, 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 Elevate. And uh, you can go on the uh, Instagram handle of LNF to find the filter. And do click your pictures and upload them. So uh, on the same lines, I have a question. There was this record-breaking selfie clicked by Ellen DeGeneres in a, on Oscars. Uh, can you name the brand, the phone from which the picture was taken? It was one of the most famous picture. The next big thing. I can see people already Googling. Yes, it's Samsung. Yeah. Okay, so uh, many of the folks here, I'm sure you would be traveling internationals, right? Yeah, you do travel internationals. So uh, anybody who has a dollar in their wallet, yeah, you do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anyone who shows first? Any foreign currency would work. Yes, we've got it. Okay, thank you. As ready as we will be. <laughs> so this is a quick primer. Um, while we're listening to a lot of uh, publishers and platforms talking about how you can leverage uh, and maximize the platform, Eventually, at the end of the day, um, what you maximize is the creative outcome. So when we talk about the full funnel thinking, when we talk about various platforms, uh, it is not the same ad that you can run in the upper funnel, the mid funnel, and the lower funnel. So how to think about creatively how to maximize or populate your funnels with what kind of advertising is the purpose of this session. So Shong, who leads our brand integration, and Nishant, who's one of the co-founders and also leads the marketing strategy, is going to talk about how to build the right kind of creative thinking for your upper funnel and mid funnel campaigns. So over to you guys, why don't we begin? Thank you. So how's been the Tofu, Mofu, and Bofu experience so far? Good? Good. I was like happily surprised when somebody said, Tofu pe baat karne I'm like, is that part of the menu? Uh, no. So it's part of the funnel and um, I think we'll just go through that because I think all this while, like they said, we've been talking about what platforms can do for all the funnels, right? Um, but there's a lot of input that goes in while thinking and most of us actually do that. 
What we are trying to do over here is to probably provide you with a how do we actually think and make sure that we've got all the right elements, inputs to actually devise a good strategy, a creative strategy that would actually yield, right? So enough has been covered. I don't think I need to speak about this. But you've got tofu, which is top of the funnel. Awareness, brand search volumes is what it gets. Mofu is middle of the funnel consideration, and I think Google spoke a lot about that. Uh, Bofu, which is bottom of the funnel purchase, most important. Uh, most people who are working in ATL usually say, hey, Bofu, that's not our problem, right? But marketers believe that, and, and rightly so, that Bofu is the most important, right? And then there's advocacy, which is repeat purchases. This, again, I'm not going to like go deep onto this, because we all know this. Uh, what happens from the awareness perspective, consideration as well as purchase. Um, this is where we'd actually like to do a deep dive. Let's look at the framework here, right? It's very important to define the business problem or an opportunity. You know, whatever is your main reason, the need for the business at that point in time, right? Identify the target audience. Believe me or not, I've got briefs from clients which says everyone. Very difficult. So you got to choose your audience, right? Who's that bullseye guy who needs you, who will advocate, right? Then it's research. We shy away, right? Most marketers say, ah, 22 lakh rupees dene padenge research ke liye. We know, we have intelligence, we have people on the sales force, all of that is there. Let's not look at research. We, we will have insights, right? But research is really, really important, right? It's also important to get down to getting that insight. And research actually helps you do that. Then comes JTBD. Love that. Job to be done. I want to create an ad. No. It is by identifying the get X to do Y by doing Z. Right? That's how we arrive at a JTBT. And then the brand guardrails. This is interesting because you know everybody in a particular brand or organization would have a different perspective about who you are. We need to have the common ground as to who you really want to be and define it because we need to define the physique and the tone of voice, right? So let's start with establishing the problem or the opportunity, right? What do we want to achieve? Is it awareness? Is it perception, love, or affinity? And what is the current brand index, right? Tom, spawn, consideration, buzz, purchase, intent, what is it? Where are we there? Then comes the KPIs. Where are we falling short? Hard questions, but we must ask them. And of course, what are your long-term and short-term goals? So I'll just add maybe a little bit here. Yeah. Typically what happens is that when you're running ads, a lot of times the brief is mostly around how can I maybe make the ad go viral? How can I make it fun? Um, and you know, a lot of times the focus is on making sure that people see the ad and remember the ad. And sometimes the product becomes a little secondary. So while all ads should have some amount of entertainment value, and that makes sense because you know the customers are going to engage, but are we sure that we have been able to communicate the problem that our product is going to solve? And is it very clear? Is it right there in the front? I think those are the things that we need to consider. That is why what we are trying to do is we are trying to take away a little bit of um, nebulous aspects of what is creativity and trying to crystallize it and trying to make a framework out of it that if we follow a certain kind of a framework, then the chances that the ad will do its job is going to be much higher, which is really the purpose of the upper funnel or the top tofu, as we call it, uh, ads is concerned. So in a way, if you're able to define the job to be done very clearly that we want the customer in this frame of mind to consider my product 
then I think we will be able to, and if you're able to articulate it real correctly, and it comes on the back of a lot of very solid research, I think the chances that we'll end up creating the right kind of an ad is very, very high. So that is that one part that we just wanted to double down on. Yeah. yeah. Now let's look at how do we find that insight, right? And insight can't happen with people sitting in the conference room and saying, hey, you know what, let's try and craft an insight, right? Crafting an insight is another story. We'll take it up some other time because most of the time we are unable to kind of articulate that insight, right? But to really find that insight, we need to go deep. We need to have a qualitative research, you know, try to find out the attitude, right, of the consumer. Uh, the qualitative, uh, the quantitative research, of course, will ratify the hypothesis that come out of the qualitative research. And then, of course, there's plethora today available, right? And thank you, Google. Um, there is so much that one, one can really find, right? Um, from what the competition is doing to, uh, you know, white papers, et cetera, et cetera. So everything together kind of creates that insight for us, both from a category perspective as well as consumer. Ooh. I turned it around, wait, hang in. Now let's look at our lovely JTBT, right? Which is get X to do Y by doing Z, right? So the first section is actually the cus customer perspective. Um, the first part is customer self-identificator. How does the customer really define himself, describe himself? Direction of improvement. Is it more or less or something? Product or process? What is being improved in that person's life? Person or thing using the product or process? What or who is being affected, right? It's not always that the guy who's buying it is also the guy who's using it. So we should be very clear who we are talking to, right? Then the contextual clarifier, right? What is that? What is the situation where this job occurs, right? Volvo, as a parent, I want to increase the safety of my child when they start driving for the first time, right? If we look at the business perspective, right? And all of us kind of try and define this. Get types of users, are they non-users, light users, heavy users? across brand or category, um, to adopt increased frequency of use or increased cons consumption per use, right? And now I give it to Nishan for consistency builds salience. There you so, go. You know, while it's, we know what the job to be done is, there's only a little question of, you know, a consistent communication. Because consistency, what it does is, it feeds into the equity of the brand over time and in turn builds saliency, right? And to, to be consistent, there are two things that we really need to nail down, you know? The physique of the brand and the personality of the brand. The physique, which is, you know, how the brand looks like. It's from logo to primary colors, secondary colors, you know, the imagery and whatnot. And to the personality, which is what does your brand sound like, which is ultimately the tone of voice. When you think about the biggest of brands in the world, if I ask you to imagine Coca-Cola in your mind, you very clearly remember the, remember the logo, you very clearly remember the color, and same goes for a brand like Dove, and same goes for a brand like Pepsi, and so on and so forth. When I talk about Paytm, you remember a certain signature, an audio tune that comes to your mind, or the same goes for Britannia, and they've been using it for a long time. If you think about Tide, you know that Tide has this swoosh that happens and there's a white patch that comes in. So a lot of very big brands have been able to build very solid identities and these are not built overnight. These cannot be built in just six months. Even a brand like, for example, one of the brands that we work with, which is Ghadi, had this iconic line, Pele istamal kare, fir vishwas kare. And a lot of us do remember that line. The point is that a brand is built over a period of time when they expose the same communication or the same style of communication over a period of time, which is where the physique comes in. 
and the personality of a brand is defined by multiple things which Nishant is going to talk about but the personality cannot change like all of us have a certain kind of a personality and it doesn't change if if I'm funny one day and I'm very angry the other day and then you know uh, I'm very sober the third the third day uh, I become unpredictable we would stop and recognizing, recognizing it yeah, pretty much so the fact is everybody has a certain way of dealing with situations and people and all of that and that is what makes our personality so if a brand today is serious but tomorrow there is a topical thing going on and the brand suddenly becomes very topical and then the third day it becomes again very serious the fact is it will never create a certain personality in the minds of its audiences but we all kind of move with the flow because that's what digital is doing so the fact is that these two are extremely sacrosanct for a brand to be built in the longer term so that is why physique and personality become a very important part of the brand building exercise so yeah, we so can you know, uh, yeah. imagine the brand as a person and this is this is our drill usually imagine the brand as a person a person who walks into a room in a party what does he look like what does he wear as opposed to you know what does he talk about what does he believe in you know stuff like that that is how you remember the person that is you know those unique features that for a long time you would connect with that person so that is you know about physique and personality there are some frameworks that we use i'm sure we all are aware of these the 12 jungian archetypes you know it to identify one archetype for a brand and it can be overlapping a lot of times but you know to identify to nail down one archetype will always you know go a long way in also identifying a particular tone of voice for the brand so so this is the first the second framework is you know is a capferous brand prism model now we have already talked about the physique and the personality what is the relationship of the brand with the consumer you know I'm, am i going to be inspirational am i going to be educational am i going to be serious etc etc and the culture of the brand itself you know what do i believe in what is my reason to exist you know stuff like that then it's very interesting the reflection and the self image the reflection is you know how the brand sees its ideal customer and as opposed to what a self image is how does the consumer the customer look at himself herself right so when we have these things nailed down you know we also top it up with a brand key which ultimately constitutes to culminates into a final brand purpose right yep. so just adding on top of this for example if you look at unilever it has a brand called dove and it also has a brand called lux right. Yeah. And Lux is all in fantasy domain, you know, you've got film stars, soap and all of that, while Dove is absolutely on the other side, which is the authenticity domain. Now, the fact is that there is, it's not saying that one way of positioning is better than the other. That's not the case at all. Both are great brands and both have great revenues. I think what is more important is that if Dove starts putting film stars in its ads and suddenly says, oh, this is the fantasy domain that Dove is in, or Lux suddenly starts talking about authenticity, I think it will be a disaster for the brand. So the fact is that consistency over a longish period of time, and longish is decades actually, when you are able to build that, only then the brand is able to create a certain very solid personality that nobody would like to tamper with. So I think that is really important. Again, with Cadbury's, you've got a dairy milk and you've got a, a five star, and they both have very different personalities, and they both will never kind of move in each other's domain. So that is what we need to do as far as brand building is concerned. So, yeah. you know, all in all, top of the funnel is about creating brand love and affinity for the brand. And we can do it with shock and awe moments, but ultimate, the ultimate goal is to, you know, to create a certain brand love in the, you know, minds, in the memories of audiences. Yep. And this also leads to, you know, how do we build memory structures like Dave has already talked about. There are certain visual signatures, certain audio signatures that we all remember. You know, the swoosh of Nike, but also the swoosh of Tide. Uh, there is a Britannia audio signature that we all, all, always know. So, you know. And this is a little case study that we very quickly want to touch upon. Uh, Hippo Homes is, you know, a, a, a global reference for a brand like this would be a Home Depot, right? They are an aggregator of building materials. So whenever you're thinking about building a home, whenever you're thinking about you know, renovating your home, 
uh, a hippo homes what it does is you know it has uh, uh, building materials it aggregates building materials and also services services like you know carpenters and plumbers and electricians so their brand problem recently was due to some amount of inactivity for the last couple of years was that it was low on brand awareness and so we went on and you know did a campaign so we we uh, did fgds we talked to people we tried to nail down some insights ki bhai jab koi ghar banata hai to sabse badi problem kya hoti hai hai na jahan yahan pe hum sabne kabhi bhi ghar banaya hai ya us process mein aaj hai तो दो तीन चीज़ें जो हम सबके साथ होती हैं बिकॉज वी लीड लीड वेरी बिजी लाइफ सो लॉट ऑफ टाइम्स यू नो ये बड़ा मुश्किल है कि भाई आप खान मार्केट से कुछ तिलक नगर से कुछ उत्तम नगर से कुछ यू नो यू यू काइंड ऑफ बिकॉज इट इज़ योर ड्रीम होम सो यू हैव टू रन पिलोर टू पोस्ट टू गेट बिल्डिंग मटीरियल्स टूगेदर बिकॉज यू वॉन्ट दैट फाइनल आउटकम सो दैट बिकॉज ऑफ आर बिजी लाइफ प्रॉब्लम वी डू नॉट गेट अनफ टाइम जब हमें कॉन्ट्रैक्टर्स मिलते हैं तो वो जनरली अनप्रोफेशनल होते हैं ये शायद हम सबका एक्सपीरियंस रहा होगा कभी ना कभी कि चार दिन का काम एक महीने में होता है पैसे पूरे दे दिए लेकिन काम पूरा नहीं हो पाया सो यू नो थिंग्स लाइक दिस बट यू नो दीज प्रॉब्लम्स दीज बिजनेस प्रॉब्लम्स हाउ डज द कंज्यूमर थिंक ऑफ इट इन साइड्स नील डाउन करें जब कोई कंज्यूमर सोचता है जब उसके पास टाइम नहीं है तो वह क्या सोचता है मैं नौकरी करूँ या घर बनाऊँ मैं किस चीज़ को टाइम दूँ यू नो एक ये भी चीज़ है कि भाई जो हम चीज़ें खरीद रहे हैं क्या वो ऑथेंटिक हैं और अगर ऑथेंटिक हैं तो क्या जितने हमने पैसे दिए उतने देने चाहिए थे या उससे कम देने चाहिए थे तो यू नो यहाँ मार्केट में सबने लूट मचा रखी है यू नो थिंग्स लाइक दीज वी कीप थिंकिंग अबाउट पैसे एडवांस में ले लेते हैं द कॉन्ट्रैक्टर्स दैट वी बिन टॉकिंग अबाउट पैसे एडवांस में ले लेते हैं लेकिन काम पूरा नहीं होता यू नो थिंग्स लाइक दीज सो वेर डिड वी अराइव सो वी डिड लॉर्ड ऑफ बिल बोर्ड्स वी डिड थ्री ब्रांड फिल्म and this was the outcome market mein sabne loot macha rakhi hai ab ghar banana simple hai payment puri kaam aadha adhoora hippo homes ab ghar banana simple hai naukri karu ya ghar banau hippo homes ab ghar banana simple hai there are some films also that uh, because of the paucity of time we'll just uh, you know quickly skim through this uh, so yeah so, i'll just add from understanding what the consumer pain point is articulating it as close to the consumer language as possible integrating that insight in the creative thinking so that consumer is able to relate to it because that is when an idea starts looking intuitive to the consumer also and then making sure that the word is spread out by running the campaign on high reach because we are talking about upper funnel is how we start building the campaign the search volume went up from 1500 searches on a monthly basis to 12000 searches on a monthly basis in just about 45 days so the fact is the campaign performs you keep scaling up you start building the brand now once you have started building an audience and you will build that audience on google on meta and everywhere it is important that the audience that starts engaging you start running high frequency campaigns on them because they have probably understood what you are trying to tell them they are probably in that moment right now so they are able to relate with the campaign pretty well and hence you have to double down through mid funnel campaigns now i just want to tell you at a high level how we think and plan mid funnel campaigns just move to the next slide so we obviously when we are looking at mid funnel campaigns it is a lot about consideration building which means here we are not trying to shock or awe the consumer we are trying to just make sure that our messaging keeps going louder and louder for the consumer memory structures continue to be there and we look at various ways in which we can ensure that our point is being made to the consumer so which is where we have a lot of these opportunities of creating multiple kinds of creatives and then seeing what creatives are performing better for the consumer in terms of various consideration uh, opportunities like uh, visit to the website like add to the cart like making sure that there is a higher growth in direct traffic better conversion rate so on and so forth optimized and set up so typically one thing that we have started looking at is hooks and angles which is which is also very important you look at various hooks as to why a consumer is going to look at it so the consumer may look at it because uh, you know the one of the hook could be pricing the other hook could be a certain kind of a value that you are providing one hook is that all things are in one place so there are various hooks that are available to a brand by which a consumer will come to them so you identify you start building creative thinking around each of those hooks so the fact is so the fact is as you must have seen in the meta session also if you are able to scale a lots of creative ads the chances of optimization is a lot better the same thing happens in google ads also 
So the point is that the more ads you're able to create, the better the outcome for uh, the brand. So this is how the entire middle funnel works. So we help brands actually build an entire middle funnel campaign thinking. We create a lot of ads and see which ones are working, double down on those, and the ones that are not performing, you can keep removing them. So that's the bit of a science that we had the case studies, but I think we're pretty much run out of time. So uh, this is how we run the upper funnel and the mid funnel campaigns. Lower funnel campaigns, as we understand, are mostly related to catalog ads because they tend to perform much better because at the end of the day, consumer will pick up what they really intend to pick up. So this is the broad level strategy that we wanted to use. And how mid funnel campaigns, you can get better CTRs. So the ones that are uh, getting you better CTRs are pretty much the ones that are performing well. So yeah, that's it. That's the end of the session. So thanks a lot. And then we'll quickly move to the next one after a five minute break. Yeah? Ah, thank you. If you want to have a conversation with us, we yeah. will sit separately after this meeting and we can tell you about how we can actually build campaigns for all of you. Thank you. So, uh, another question for everyone. Can you guess how many active users are there on Quora as of today? Any random guesses? Bang on. So, our next section is from Quora. That will be a half an hour session. So, we'll start in another five minutes. Guys, guys. Check. Any video will be still yeah, there is there, but uh, I would like to just showcase. I think there's not. Oh, it's not easy. It's yeah, not audio. Works, works. Yeah. yeah. 
एक प्रेजेंटेशन जो है ये मेरे पीछे रहेगा ये ऐसे हो सकता है ताकि यू नो आई है ना ताकि मेरे को दिख जाए बस बस थोड़ा सा ऐसे ताकि मुझे दिख जाए है ना कि मैं जो आई एम एज्यूमिंग सैमिलिनिस्टी होगा राइट आई थिंक आप कबल ऑफ पीपल आर सेटिंग डाउन Check, 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 check. Uh, can you all hear me? A thumbs up would do. Ah, uh, thank you. I can, I can see one. Perfect. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Just after the lunch time, there is a session, and of course, you know. it's a friday afternoon uh, a lot to catch up as well during the rest of the day so i'll try and make my uh, session quite interesting interactive and uh, make it more insightful for all of you uh, so first i'll start with uh, thanking all of you you know the team uh, lexan and flamingo to actually organizing this such a wonderful event uh would like to thank uh, dev you know for conceptualizing this idea this is quite a wonderful one and uh, you know it has of course taken a good shape a lot of uh, clients are over here and uh, i believe and lot of our they're listening to us uh, online as well uh, right now so it's a great moment to have uh, us over here thank you okay so you know i i'll just quickly introduce myself uh, that's me i'm sumit anand i'm managing the uh, north and east business of uh, kora uh, i have uh, about 15 years of experience uh, majorly into the digital space uh, where i've worked with companies like yahoo sony live woot and about two and a half years of experience with kora as, as well till now so this session is majorly towards uh, kora but you know we are in the world where the discussion is also about generative ai so is kora there in that segment do you think do you think kora has any linkage towards ai right now if anyone knows raising a hand would be good okay i'll just quickly tell you that we have a product called po p o e it's a aggregator of all the chat bots available right now so we have chat gpt there are versions of chat gpt 4 and all De delhi and many more chat bots which are available so kora has a product which is uh, an aggregator so people can just go to that destination and uh, get their answer at one platform uh, the brain behind this platform is our ceo adam d angelio and uh, just give a more context to him uh, he is the board member of open ai he was the board member of open ai the previous one changed to the new one he is still there he is the only one who knows remain the uh, board member over there so uh, yes you know po is there uh, as a very very strong uh, product from kora not many people are aware right now and not much of you know promotion are also happening but of course very soon when we are ready to monetize or thinking on those lines of course you know will come up with that idea as well today over here we'll be majorly talking about uh, kora so kora in india just somebody asked this question some time back that you know what is the monthly active audience on the kora platform uh, someone said i think it wasn't too lively loudly to be heard by everyone but it is more than 100 million active audience base on the on the uh, in uh, india right now uh what we plan to do we plan to cover quite a, a bit of uh, like you know strong relevant topics in detail so that you know you guys can actually take away some relevant information from this session today starting with the uh, the core topic which is harnessing the power of high intent advertising how kora can be utilized in your marketing mix 
how Quora can be utilized for your strategy in related to content, uh, in related to video, and many advantages you know, which, is, which are there, and above all, the India insights of the Quora platform. To start with, uh, when, we come, when we talk about leveraging the high intent audience, it has various benefits to talk. It actually helps in increasing the conversion potential, uh, improvise the ROI, increase the campaign performance, overall cost efficiency goes down and gets better, and above all, the strong brand connect. By leveraging the high intent advertising, a brand actually gets a benefit which is beyond the uh, regular set of advertising, it actually gets a it, it gives a maximize on the results and the marketing efforts. We have an interesting case study of Healthy Fi Me. Uh, maybe touching to a lot of our online uh, users also right now, because New Year has happened, Saal Neha Shuru Hai, so resolutions hote hain, you know, we'll do uh, this and that about our health. I also have one, anyway. So, uh, two years back, uh, we started working with Healthify Me, uh, which was about, the brief was given to us was about that, you know, they want uh, to create a brand awareness on our platform. They want to connect deeper into the, you know, users of our platform. What we did, we help out with the relevant set of questions which are related to them in the health and fitness category. We decipher them in a way that one can actually make a strategy for the year long. When we started, we helped them with each and every step, you know, which is related to the content, how the content should be written, what kind of tonality should be there, what kind of questions should be answered first, and then, you know, the strategy to be there for the entire year. It worked out pretty, pretty well for the brand. Brand, from a, from a mere no presence on the platform to uh, starting to get to see the higher SOV brand score, overall brand trust on the platform was very, very high. So that was happening, you know, we then actually added another layer of our advertisement, uh, uh, you know, formats, which are native ads and native video ads. What we did is actually, you know, we clubbed these two into the promoted answers. Uh, so people who have actually watched the answers, seen the answers, you know, we are actually now targeting with them with the native ads and native video ads to make it more interactive. So you've read it, now let's take an action. And we saw phenomenal results. The CTRs were above 6%. There were answers which were above, you know, 10% also. And the VTR overall was more than 60%. So overall, that was a good, impactful case study, you know, by Healthify Me on our platform. We move further, we'll quickly talk about where does Quora lands? See, Quora is not a passive, quick, thumb-scrolling platform, which we all use, use every day. Quora is also not a platform which is where, you know, people mostly have taken a decision. It fits in between. The mindset of a Quora is that I'm here to read more, I'm here to learn more, I'm, I'm here to educate myself, I'm here to invest on myself. I am closer to the idea of, like, before purchasing, but I've still not made up my mind. And here, you know, when I'm reading the personal responses of, you know, users on the Quora platform, it's actually helping me to in take my, you know, decision into the, uh, into a shape. So this, which is where, you know, Quora actually helps to a lot of users. See, if you were to talk about Quora, it's not a play platform where, you know, you follow your friends or family. It's actually based on your interest is what you get to see the questions on your feed, which makes it more relevant and interesting format for the users. A lot of our users do a research on the Quora platform uh, before actually buying a product. If you were to say that, you know, where, where does uh, uh, this helps? This actually helps the entire ecosystem. So brand, when they are thinking of, you know, connecting with the users, if it is there at the moment when actually they are into deep research mode, it's a prime moment for the brand to actually influence that user there then. 
conversations on the Quora platform are happening all the way, and, and you know there are communities which are uh, which are defined in, in each and every segments. And uh, when these when these uh, relevant information come across by the user, the user take a action by interact engaging with that you know content by upvoting, by commenting, by sharing, etc. So that makes the content relevant for that user. And the next time when the user is coming, he gets to see more relevant content. He gets to see the email on his uh, email ID, the Quora digest. Again, a relevant set of content bring the user back to the Quora platform. And thus, the, the entire cycle goes on. Uh, a user gets to see a relevant uh, result, and he gets to come, he get come back to the platform every now and then. See, millions of users, internet users, are there right now looking for some of the other information. When it comes to Quora, they come for clear purpose. There's a purpose of reading, learning, and educating themselves. I'll tell you, a large base of our audience are coming via the search. So search becomes the first mode for them to come to the Quora platform. And when they are, th they are there in this platform, as a brand, just by being present, one can actually you know, close the loop of that user when which, which he started from the search platform. Now, when he's there on a, on a particular question, a brand can actually connect with that user and influence, and actually close the uh, loop when the user is uh, you know, in the consideration or the research mode. Quora audience is quite valuable. You know, it's a premium set of audience in fact, more than one third of the you know, users uh, write information, write their reviews on the Quora platform. This is backed by our uh, you know, global, global survey partner. When we compare platform with you know, other available social, pla social media channels, Quora, is quite, Quora audience is quite receptive, as well as you know, the perfect set of audience for the brands to have. Why I'm saying so is because a brand can start the communication with the users by answering those questions what users have asked about, start to you know, communicate with the entire community, create an create a entire conversation between the, you know, within the community within uh, that particular category, and come as a thought leader. So brand, when they are coming on Quora, they get a, get a great opportunity of becoming a thought leader along with various other objectives of which are being met simultaneously. So it's a great way to be present right there and then when your user is looking and a response from you. Now I'll talk about some insights of the, you know, India per se. So information on the Quora platform is divided into various segments. We call them topics. There are various topics. More than 400,000 topics are there overall. For, for brands to know a broad understanding, there are, there are topics which are like health, broad topics like health, automotive, entertainment, consumer durable, etc. Like many more topics are there. When brand tends to work with us, we go deeper. We tell them that, okay, these are the relevant set of topics for you. And you know, as you interact more with these set of topics within the user, your information go, will go out to the relevant set of audience and the in, more engagement set to happen. I'll, I have a couple of examples for each vertical to showcase that, you know, how exactly uh, each topic for, perform on the platform. Starting with travel, one of the most relevant used a revenge set of travel is also happening these days, so a, people, a lot of people can actually relate to it as well. So on the Quora platform, uh, because this, so this is one of the high engaging, you know, a research based topic, people do come to this one a lot. And when, when you know, users come, they actually tend to uh, read, they tend to gain information. One of the insight, you know, which I'll just share uh, as a top, is that 52% of the Quora audience is, uh, they, they prefer to buy a travel insurance. It's a beautiful insight for, let's say, a travel insurance organization. We go deeper and talk more about travel. 
there are relevant sort of topics which are there, you know, which actually can be tagged on if you have a, if you plan to run a campaign which is related to travel on the platform. Airlines, passport, visa, travel experience, international travel, you know, these are some of the topics which are quite relevant for the, uh, you, uh, for the brands to get, connect with the users. Ecom and retail. Uh, another very, very engrossed uh, set of category. Uh, you know, the data says 67% of the Quora user prefer to buy, uh, prefer to shop online. When it comes to the top uh, topics within e-com the retail vertical, they are shoes, clothing, overall set of uh, fashion, fashion and uh, lifestyle sort of topics are there. We go further to automotive, you know, where we have uh, in some of the insights like more than half of the audience are uh, preferring to go towards hybrid. Uh, some of the keywords which are very re relevant for this vertical is electric vehicle and cars and automobile, car care, etc. Consumer electronics, another favorite to uh, broad topic and I'm sure very close to a lot of people, people who keep buying stuff for their home. Great insight to you know, come out uh, is that more than 50% of the audience on the platform, they do have a plan to buy AC, refrigerator, washing machine, etc. So th these are the potential set of signs for the brands to target these audience on the Quora platform. The relevant set of topics for these audiences are household appliances, kitchen appliances, and the re relevant set of categories uh, like ref and AC, etc. One of the interesting way which we use on the platform is the overlapping conversation. Uh, this is a great way for the brands to actually leverage it to broaden their horizon on the Quora platform. So, like for example, uh, I'll give you an example of uh, a fitness apparel brand who the core TG of course would be fitness, health set of or sports set of category. But by mixing, by adding nutrition, wellness, lifestyle, exercise set of topics, they're actually expanding their reach. And it is time and tested set of uh, approach, which has given a lot of, you know, case studies and uh, real life examples to us to actually be really sure that a marketing effort which are going towards expanding the reach on the Quora platform to a correlated set of audience works brilliantly. We have one example over here and I'll just take one, uh, Intel. Uh, so Intel is, uh, you know, Intel came to us saying that they want to target the B2B set of users on the Quora platform. That's a quite set of, quite a serious audience, decision makers in the organization, that too in a large set of organization. So who are the TG? Primarily would be the IT heads, you know, CTOs, CEOs, et cetera, sort of audience are there. So what we did, we actually, you know, worked on the set of topics which are quite relevant for them, made a pool of those, worked with the client and you know, filter it out in a way that the exact communication of vPro goes out to these set of audiences so that we can expect the better result. The results were phenomenal. We saw great CTR for the image campaigns, 1.5 X CTR for the video campaign. It was amazing. Now I'll talk about targeting on the Quora platform. So there are four layers of targeting on this platform. Starting with the contextual. So contextual is basically a real-time targeting on Quora. Contextual has topics. When I say topic, it means that people who are following these topics, you can target those audience. Let's say if I'm not following a topic, can I be targeted? Yes. How? Because if I'm consuming a t content which is related to a particular topic, I can still be targeted. So thus contextual is a real-time topic-related conversation and a user can be targeted with that. Second, keywords. You have your Google keywords, use it over here. Whenever a user is there on a question and if those keywords are there on the question, the user can be targeted. Great way. You, know, you, you actually minimize your wastage. It's cut across to the right TG and you just 
spread your information and you know if he's interested he'll click on it third questions it's a question platform so questions can be put across more than 100 questions can actually come and uh, be selected in one of the campaigns and it just when the user is reading on that particular question is when the campaign can be targeted second one is the interest based targeting interest is based on the last 30 days interest of the user on the quora platform every other things remain the same so topic keyword and question are there in this behavioral targeting as well the third one is quite deeper one you know quite engaging one which is audience targeting which is where you know brands tend to segment their audience use this platform even more strategic where they bucket it in a way like, okay, this is my lookalike set of segment. This is my retargeted segment. This is my deduplicated one. And likewise, you know, I want to reach out to these uh, audience differently. Lastly, broad. Brands who have audience across the place, there is a way to let the system optimize for your creative, which means by auto-bidding, auto-targeting, you know, it's actually you are letting the system optimize your creative and reach out to the relevant set of audience who have been sharing their behavior on the Quora platform. These are some of the examples of how they have been using uh, these, all these targetings. There are three broad ad formats which we have. Promoted answers, native ads, which include image and text, and native video. For each and every objective, the set format is relevant. For example, if the objective is top of the funnel, we recommend promoted answers and we recommend video ads. For mid funnel, we recommend all the four formats which we have. For the bottom funnel, we recommend video, text, image. So these are the proven uh, set of uh, strategies you know, which, we have, which we have and taken the brands to uh, them in their various side of journey. Okay, another in exciting and interesting way to use the Quora platform. Now, Influencer marketing, a lot of brands are doing these days. Is there a way to do that on Quora? The answer is yes. How? There are three ways. One, you can have your own internal uh, you know, thought leader to come as a uh, thought leader on the Quora platform, as a profile. One can answer and you know, then uh, uh, can actually respond to a lot of queries what people have. So we have uh, many examples. I'll just take one right now. IND Money, so we have Ashish Kashyap, who's the you know, founder of the organization. He's very much active on the Quora platform, responding on to questions of people, queries of people, and uh, helping a lot. So it actually helped the user to connect with the brand in a way. It creates a great transparency, trust, and uh, favorability towards the brand. Uh, another one, uh, your own influencer, people who are there all across the other social channels, Use them. We have uh, seen uh, Amazon uh, Prime Video, you know, utilizing their uh, influencers uh, on Quora and ask them to write about the upcoming and the recent uh, web series. The third and very interesting way is ask your happy customers to write good about the, your brand on Quora. A lot of you will find a lot of them uh, all over the place. Uh, a lot of educational brands use this strategy where they actually ask their ex-students to write or narrate about their experience uh, and uh, write it on Quora. And a brand can actually promote all of these uh, three ways, uh, CXOs or you know, influencers or even the you know, customers can actually promote it on Quora platform. Quora is predominantly the text-heavy platform uh, but you know, two years back when we when we launched uh, a video format, uh, we wanted to test the water, and you know the response was pretty pretty good. Uh, we have a lot of brands who are you know, working with us, coming up for uh, their you know video campaigns, because uh, it's a great way to engage with the same user, but it's uh, maybe a different message, but in a different way. So we have a lot of uh, these uh, brands who are there with us. We have a VTR of 42 person. Uh, this is not working. Okay. A lot of case, uh, success stories are there, but I'll just take one. And 
So uh, Realme, for example, Realme has been uh, working with us for long and very, very effectively using the promoted answers. How we help them? We actually help them with uh, bucketing the set of users who have actually interacted with their promoted answers. Now with the video ads, the response was amazing. Uh, the engagement rate was very high. The uh, VTR was also very, very high. So a lot of brands working with us, it's a great opportunity to have you know, all you guys as well on the, on the platform. What I would uh, say is that it's a platform which you might not be aware, so I'll just quickly talk about it. So it's a platform which, is, which has uh, you know, capabilities just like Google and a Meta. It's a real-time bidding platform available in both self-serve as well as a managed service. And, uh, uh, all the formats are available, CPC, CPM, CPV, etc., uh, which one can use to uh, buy and buy inventory at. Lastly, uh, I don't think you know would be able would have been able to cover each and every element of it. But you know, if you think that uh, this thing you know makes sense for your brand, uh, we are there. You know, we are we have a team, Paroma. Uh, uh, the senior client partner, Sahaj, customer success manager, and I'm there, we are there, and uh, if we can actually help, I'm sure, you know, now after this, we can actually share more examples because you can actually relate a lot of these examples to your, uh, you know, uh, current stage. So that's it from my end. Thank you very much. We are, op yeah, open for the queries, yes. Do you have any case studies, as I said, with very early stage, let's say like less than six months, would you recommend us to actually come and uh, start uh, you know, advertising on Quora? Or would you would say that it's more suited for more mature uh, startups? Okay, no, great question. So see, uh, questions are coming every day, uh, a lot in numbers for us. Now, these questions are coming from the real users if they, they would be responded by maybe another users also. But if you know if the brand is responding to these questions in a way, users get a feeling that okay, you know, uh, it's, it's a brand who's taking a responsibility of take, answering these questions are uh, kind of, you know, I, am, I, I feel that I'm, I'm more closer to these brands. They kind of connect with them, they build a trust. And then it's not only one user which gets affected, it's also the other set of users who come and read those answers. So it's definitely, it, this platform matters for each and every brand, whatever stage they are at. Because maybe at the early stage, the question volume might be low for that particular brand, but uh, how, how we have actually helped you know, a lot of brands where we've asked them to create queries. If let's say one does not find many queries, ask uh, questions on the Quora platform, all the question goes anonymous. So user is not, going to be aware that who has created this question, but even ask, after asking question, one has provided the answer, you actually close the loop. Sorry, but then do you also have a mix of, okay, how many tier one audiences do you have versus tier two city versus tier three city? Maybe I missed this in the presentation, so sorry about that. Uh, good question. Yes, you know, that, that's, you know, that's not there in this one, but I can tell you that it's a good mix of audience, you know, what we get on a platform. Uh, predominantly, it's a tier, heavy on tier one, tier two, less on tier three. Why? Because uh, it's, a, it's, it's a more of an education set of a platform. You know, people who are a little more aware, uh, they tend to connect with this. Because, you know, Quora is not new. It's an old platform. So people who have already been using it, so they're aware. Uh, tier three is it's getting into it because, you know, we're also coming up with our regional set of uh, languages, trying to go deeper. Uh, so I'm just clarifying. So you have some sponsored content, which can, which is an opportunity for brands. Like she said, for early uh, early stage uh, startups, seeding is what you recommend. But is that possible to do in a branded fashion, or will will that will those questions need to be 
generic, more category-led or, you know, how does it help to get the conversation going for a brand? I'll give you an example. Um, so, we have a, a brand called Ultratech. Now, we all know Ultratech and Sindhu, the cement. Uh, you know, the, they have chosen the strategy of writing on Quora not to actually become a, you know, a, by selling their product, it's not a salesy kind of approach which they've taken. They've taken an approach of thought leader. They're trying to help the user to cut across to all the queries which are related to, when somebody's thinking of buying a house, there are various layers you know, which one gets into before one start to construct. So they're covering all the elements of it. And there are a lot of basic, basic questions you know, which are there which people are asking uh, and you know, they're trying to address those. Another example, Bridgestone. Bridgestone is uh, very, very effectively using this platform by answering those questions which are very broad in structure. Like, when is the right time to exchange the tire? How do I get to know that my tire is, like, you know, is in the wrong condition, like it's time to make a change? Or why the tire is in black in color? These are very, very basic questions, a generic question, but you know, the uh, uh, brand has taken a stand to answer those questions and come as a thought leader, come as an advocate for their brand on the platform. So it is, uh, to just uh, summarize you know, uh, to your question, see, start with the generic one and first see that uh, what kind of response you're getting. And then go very specific because ultimately as a brand, you would try to answer those questions which people have, let's say they have some issue or the, some problems going on, you, your brand is trying to help. So that, that way, you know, if you can try it with a funneling approach, that will really help. I hope I've answered the question. Thanks. I just feel that uh, by the by virtue of what the platform is, it's more referral, recommendation. You know, if it's too much of branded question answer and planted uh, content, I don't know how that goes for the credibility of the platform. Got that. And, and an early stage uh, business has to have has to make very conscious calls on how much of the business to push versus how much of advocacy, you know? So in terms of the funnel as well, that's but the only thing. But maybe we can have a conversation. I'll just, just add one point over here and a uh, good question and it might be relevant for others too. See, uh, on the platform, the two kind of approach which I was explaining what let's say education brands have taken. So take a testimonial approach when you know it's about uh, that yes this brand is really good i myself have tested it so i am becoming as a advocacy for this brand and this brand is not paying me anything so if if you come as a as, as that brand and of course that will happen through a user profile not from a business profile use your use business profile to answer all the queries which are related to the features of the brand the usp of the brand how bra that brand can help uh, you know the basic issues of the user that will be very much appreciated. Yes. Yes, yes. Any other question anyone have? All right. Great, I think, you know, uh, if you have any other question, you can uh, like you know let us know. We are around only. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Sumit, for a lovely session. Thanks. Peace. So our next session uh, is uh, as a fireside chat with Shopify and LNF team. It is about future of commerce, and now Shopify is being an integral part of that. So a couple of sessions more left for the day.
Sorry for that. Uh, so we are beginning our fireside chat with Shopify. Uh, this is about the future of commerce uh, because we have a 2024 vision. Uh, and we have... Yeah, uh, great question. Uh, I always <laughs> like to kick off uh, with a merchant-focused uh, question. So, uh, so basically, you know, Shopify um, is one of the few platforms that actually caters to the entire breadth of you know merchants. Whether you're an entrepreneur who's starting out or uh, a large enterprise, uh, since you asked specifically about enterprises, right? Uh, we generally have a Shopify Plus offering for those kind of uh, merchants, uh, and uh, Online customer is online also, he is, um, and online also he is visiting you on your site, he is visiting you potentially on a marketplace, he is visiting you on some third party content platform, maybe social media, right? So your customer is everywhere, so you need a platform that enables you to do that commerce across these channels seamlessly, and uh, Shopify does that to a large extent. Uh, in fact, last year we also released a uh, whole host of uh, B2B features because we are seeing that also now grow where merchants who used to primarily do B2B offline are now beginning to sell through their own online store to businesses, right? Uh, the third thing I would say is efficiency and automation, right? Um, that's a big theme, uh, you know, saving cost uh, is big. People want to be profitable uh, and grow sustainably. And to that extent, uh, Shopify provides a lot of automation features. Uh, and last is you want world-class support, right? And uh, there we are able to do it. Uh, uh, we have a 24-7 plus support team that uh, helps merchants, sure. and we're able to do it with a robust ecosystem like you all, right, who help merchants uh, really use the best, uh, get right. the best out of the platform. Thank you for that. Yeah. So, absolutely. I think uh, the way we've seen a lot of people and a lot of merchant partners or partners move to Shopify. Uh, one of the things which you said that Shopify helps convert better. Uh, it is also uh, has products and services for the entire spectrum of you know merchants and partners here. Uh, how do you see the role of? My next question is around this: that uh, when you're looking at a, a Shopify site or a merchant site, there is a lot of data and analytics which go into it. Today we we've, we've had a lot of sessions where we've spoken about customer engagement on how enhancements on how what can you do 
to ensure that the journey is much better and how do you ensure or what are the things and the role of data to, which is there in Shopify to improve this uh, conversion rate. So when conversion rate is better, is there anything which Shopify does with the help of data to improve the conversion rates? Sure. Yeah. So Shopify is a data driven company and we want the same kind of experiences for all our merchants. Uh, overall around more than 500 million people shop from a Shopify website which is an insane amount of data which is like one in every five shopper across the world. Uh, and to power our merchant websites we rely on this particular information the kind of uh, data these shoppers are searching. So it starts from the search where, where you can find recommended products based on your search the entire recommendation engine for, for your store. After that, as a Shopify merchant, you can completely customize your checkout. If you are on Shopify Plus, you can just convey your brand ethos on the checkout. Uh, if you are into different uh, channels, you can have a same loyalty program across all the ch 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 channels. Apart from that, we have something called a Shopify query language, which is basically a structured language where the command is in English. Just imagine any kind of data that you want to go after. You just need to give, give, give a command, like show me a list of customers who have not bought in the last six months in this particular location. It will, come, it will show you the list with all kind of cuts and you can run any kind of promos, offers over, over there. So Shopify completely relies on data and that's how we empower our merchants. Very interesting. I think yeah. uh, the way it is being structured today, that is a very simple English command to give you the outcome. Yeah. where you can then manage and create a certain kind of a promo. So it's very interesting and that's how what a lot of merchant partners are looking to try and simplify their lives when they are hustling between logistics and uh, you know uh, product quality as well as trying to uh, maybe solve a lot of things from a personal point of view. Uh, the website and the entire customer engagement is something which Shopify can then help them with. Yeah and you know you can also like rip like raise the bar, right, when it comes to customer engagement. Just wanted to add one point, right? Like, you can definitely use what Shopify has, but sometimes you have, like, uh, data across outside of Shopify as well that you want to sort of combine together, right? And so in those cases, we uh, integrate into platforms like MoEngage uh, or CDPs you can use, right? Like, so Shopify is extensible in that sense and connects with a whole host of apps that can help you really raise the bar on how to use data. Data is definitely the new oil. Right. It's truly democratic in nature for yeah. the merchants, for the partners, for everybody who wants to come and use the platform. Yeah. I think there is an opportunity as well as a scalability plat uh, you know, op option for everybody. That's right. Ayush yeah. made a great point about uh, you know, a simple English command resulting into uh, you know, query. Okay. Okay, got it. Okay. So Ayush made a great point about, uh, you know, uh, a simple English sentence resulting in a report or a simple English sentence resulting in, you know, adding quantities, inventories of products into your Shopify website. I think they call it Shopify magic. It's an AI tool, uh, which is pretty much magic. And uh, the, the, the one thing that it brings me to is, you know, uh, while AI is solving so many challenges that is, uh, you know, the challenges that a merchant faces, what are the general challenges that you see across the board, you know, that merchants face and uh, how does Shopify help overcome all of those challenges? Yeah, so um, I'll just touch upon a little bit about AI, right? You just yeah. mentioned that. I think uh, that's the theme that we've all been hearing about over the last six months. I think everyone's trying to adopt AI in some form. Um, so I, I personally am very pro AI because I think uh, it enables humans to do far more right and uh, uh, Shopify over the last one year like we had our summer editions where we announced Shopify magic right and uh, Shopify magic is uh, basically our host uh, our basic our bundle of AI enabled features for merchants right so that they can do more with uh, their time right uh, and some of it is to uh, basically help them with language generation right so there's uh, uh, Shopify Magic enables you to uh, come up with product descriptions. Uh, you can use it uh, on your blogs within Shopify inbox, right? So that you can do more quickly, right? 
Uh, then there's a sidekick that we announced, which is uh, not fully launched yet, but uh, definitely showing very, very promising results. And uh, basically, it's an AI-assisted, AI assistant, because every entrepreneur is a superhero, according to us, and they need a sidekick. So that's what, uh, that's why we call it the sidekick. And uh, it'll help you with uh, basic things, right? Like if you want to see, uh, enable a discount code, a welcome discount code, you can go ahead and just tell your sidekick to do that. It'll generate the uh, AI code and you would then just approve it, right? It will take no action without your approval, right? So. Uh, that's uh, another, and then uh, we're also starting to use AI to help merchants pick, uh, you know, access that vast ecosystem of apps I was telling you about. So app reviews, for example, uh, you know, the AI tool that we have released will basically look at all the reviews that merchants have left and give you a summary of it, right? So we're beginning to use it in a way to help merchants more and more, right? right? Uh, yeah, just sharing a little bit about that. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, now, uh, cutting into something else with respect to, you know, overall challenges that customers face, while AI would address a very significant portion of that, uh, the, the active ecosystem that you have with respect to your apps, with respect to every other integration, some of which you talked about, you know, integrations with CDPs, et cetera, uh, that also I believe is something that would help uh, a lot with uh, challenges that merchants typically face. Right, to scale, basically. To scale, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, everyone, uh, you know, uh, is looking for a platform that can help them, you know, scale. So right. in that sense, uh, I think some of the basics are in place, you know, like in, in Shopify, you can trust, like in that sense, that you don't have to get your, uh, you don't have to get into managing your servers and all of that. The platform scales up seamlessly. Uh, we, we are able to uh, do almost 40,000 checkouts a minute uh, on the platform, right? So th there's, that's some serious scale there, right? Uh, in addition to that, uh, you know, we've helped merchants really extend themselves with a lot of useful features like, uh, say, you know, oftentimes merchants are planning campaigns and, you know, need help with executing them seamlessly. So we've launched a, plat uh, a solution called Launchpad, right, uh, which basically you can uh, pre-configure so that uh, come Sunday night, you have a new product launch, the theme changes on its own, the product gets launched, the discount codes become active. And it remains like that for the duration of your, uh, you know, for campaign design. Uh, after which it reverts back, right? Uh, there's a tool called Shopify Flow, which really helps merchants to automate basic processes, right? So you you have a catalog, you have products, it's run out of uh, inventory. You can just write a basic uh, code saying, "Hey, take the product down once that happens," right? And that will happen automatically, right? So like that. Uh, flow can be extended to multiple use cases, right? You want to reward your super customers, you can do that using simple trigger-based logic, right, uh, on Flow. Uh, and yeah, a whole host of uh, such features basically uh, help merchants to like, you know, make the most of the platform. I think Ayush touched upon checkout um, uh, already, right, uh, and how to upsell and cross-sell. So those are ways in which we help merchants really, you know, scale. only uh, getting ROI was that easy. I think <laughs> all of your us here would have uh, you know, jumped quickly to Shopify. But I think uh, what it does is it just generally helps you take care of everything else and then focus more on uh, strategies as well as maybe even as marketers for us, you know, get getting the right kind of customer on the platform. Once you are able to get the right kind of customer on the platform, everything else could be taken care of by Shopify. Uh, one of the key themes for us this year, and my next question is about that, is how can we help Indian brands as well as the brands which are functioning in India go global? Uh, a very quick, uh, you know, the first question we get is how do we do that? You know, the first question is, uh, is it uh, is the technology available? Can I ensure my site, uh, my website can function not only in India, but also function globally? Can I collect? Uh, money from the customers in global currencies. Uh, so uh, while there are other questions around logistics as well as integrations, I'm sure that the apps which you have would be integrated across multiple geographies, but is it easy to use Shopify to expand globally or are there certain steps which merchants need to take to go ahead and look at global expansion? Because that's where we see a lot of people have interest and a lot of client partners are also looking at uh, to move to other geographies. 
Uh, all right, so it's a great question and uh, something with which Shopify is very serious about as well. Like almost 15% of our overall sales happen via cross-border. Uh, so see, Shopify is a truly global company. Our merchants are present in more than 135 countries, which means if as a merchant, if you want to expand to any of those countries, we have the entire ecosystem in place. Like you have shipping uh, providers, you have the payment providers, we have our own payment solution, ShopPay, which is available in most of those countries. Uh, so the first step is done. Second thing is, uh, you don't need to worry about com being compliant. We have all the compliance in checks, and for every country, wherever you go, you will be fully compliant as per the local laws and uh, of the country. Now, with for enterprise mer merchants, to those who are us using Shopify Plus, we have something called as expansion stores. Now, if you have to expand to some other country, you need not create a different website altogether. You can use one of the expansion store. With Shopify Plus, you can expand in up to nine different markets without paying anything extra. Uh, you can start with one or two of your key markets to test waters. And what expansion stores does is, in a normal scenario, if you are just replicating your current website to, to a, another market, you cannot truly benefit from the market. All the markets have different sale periods, the customer behavior is different, you may want to keep different pricing. With expansion stores, it's a different store altogether, where you, where, whereas you can manage everything from a single console. So if it's a Black Friday in the US, you can have your local promos in some other country. And uh, yes, very easily with the help of our partners, our ecosystem partners, our agency partners like you, you can be up and running in different markets in no time. So it's like one back-end system but nine shop fronts where yeah. I can have different offers, different pricing, different product selection uh, for all the different geographies where we want uh, the merchant to be presented. 100%, yes. Thank you. So just to add, we have integrations with payment partners across uh, multiple countries, right? So say you launch in the US, we'll have all the payment partners there. And you're launching in Europe, you'll have all the payment partners there, right? So you can pick and choose who you want, who you want to work with. And for shipping, you can also, uh, you know, we obviously have all the direct shipping integrators, integrations like, uh, you know, you can, um, you can do an aggregator like a Shiprocket X, or you can even work with uh, players like DHL, FedEx. The entire ecosystem is also up and running, right? Uh, definitely an area to grow. Uh, and uh, that interesting stat that we were talking about right now, uh, that about 70 million buyers last year uh, shopped on an India store from across the world, right? Like, that's a significant number of merchants, uh, sorry, buyers shopping from an India store outside, from outside. Right, so definitely a growing trend, uh, something to explore, but you should do it when your brand is ready, right? Absolutely. Um, yeah. So uh, fantastic, I think uh, just maybe I can take a minute. Uh, when we're looking at expansion, we have, uh, we've been working with Google as well as partners like you to try and help ease the process of global expansion. Uh, for those who would not heard this, uh, next month uh, we would have a session, a similar session, but it will only be focused towards global expansion for Indian brands and maybe where we can also highlight a few more uh, and get into this, delve into this topic into detail on what are the stepwise process of uh, Indian merchant partners to try and expand into global geographies. So uh, with all that talk about AI and all the features that we have available, it brings me to wonder about the future of commerce. So, you know, because we are talking about 2024, we are trying to plan for the year. What is it that Shopify has in store for us for the future of commerce? What, what are the new trends that you see that are emerging with respect to, uh, you know, merchants across the globe or even in India for that matter? Uh, how do you, if you had to summarize in terms of what's the future of commerce for the merchants present here, what would you say? Ooh, that's, uh, I wish I could tell the the, the future, but uh, I'm sure it's exciting. I'll start there. Um, but to start, like, just to share, right, like, uh, so we have a Future of Commerce report that we release every year, which is deeply researched. It will be coming up um, this year also. Uh, so, so be on the lookout for that. Uh, just in terms of, uh, you know, some of the things that we've seen, right, like at a, at a high level, uh, from last year, and I think it'll go on, right, like, if you look a couple of years back, right, you had primarily offline, 
uh, as the place where commerce used to happen. Then online came with marketplaces. Then you have your uh, D2C boom. Um, and then through COVID, you saw like that getting supercharged. And uh, post-COVID, offline came back, right? And we've seen uh, that it's not a pure offline, return to pure offline, right? It's now omni-channel uh, sort of commerce that's happening, which is digitized. And we're also seeing commerce models that were outside of like the B2C really come in and get digitized as well. So we are also seeing now businesses wanting to dig digitize their B2B e-commerce, e right? So that's where I see the future uh, evolving, right? And uh, be on the lookout for the future of commerce report. I think it'll, it'll generally comes out in the first quarter itself. So uh, I'll share that uh, with uh, you all as well. Um, and uh, just one more thing that you know I, I'm personally excited about is that in India, there's almost 600 million uh, uh, you know, people on video platforms, right? Uh, and so these new models of commerce, right? Like you're seeing social uh, platforms already uh, showing you know, commerce happening, but video commerce is another one that I'm super excited about. I think uh, you know, we have a YouTube integration uh, as well, which uh, enables merchants to use their YouTube channel and start selling, uh, you know, so I think that is an interesting one. And I feel like through 2024, cost is something that uh, brands will be uh, cautious about uh, and to ensure that they grow profitably. So I think you guys have a big role there to play. Uh, yeah, so those are some of the things that I see. Okay, that sounds great. Um, let's move it to the audience if uh, some of our folks have some questions uh, for the folks for Shopify. Um, what I want to ask about Shopify is that it has streamlined the dashboard very much for any layman like seeing for the first time, like they get to understand sales, the traffic and everything else. But is there uh, any development happening in near future where we can plug in all kinds of marketing activities also from Shopify? Like currently we have to uh, integrate with a lot of external channels, which are certainly not part of Shopify, like Meta is there, Google is there. Uh, Twitter is there, but is there any scope where we can integrate all kinds of activities into one in Shopify and any household having a setup of their own business can run all kinds of marketing campaigns, which you say a 360 degree marketing can happen from one platform itself. If you ask me, we're in, we're in the era of differential commerce, right? Um, which basically uh, thrives on the fact that you use that particular software or solution provider who is the best at what they do, and and you sort of knit it together, right? Um, uh, while having a single backend, right? Potentially, right? So. In that sense, we try to sort of cover that gap by providing uh, seamless integrations with apps through our app store, right? Uh, and while you're able to still use that particular solution provider who's best at what they do, right? I don't see that changing, right? I only see more and more of that happening. I think the experience of using these platforms will continue to improve, right? There'll be improvements there. Uh, and yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of benefit in that because Essentially, when you when you use Shopify, you know you're using the best commerce technology. When you're using Google, you know you know and their ads, then you know that you are able to access their user base across multiple uh, you know touch points. Facebook for theirs, you know, and like that, right? The respective services only investing more and more to improve in that. So I I don't see that changing. Uh, I think. Uh Though I don't know, uh, as in uh, there is a lot of things maybe Shopify could come up in the future, but what we understand from our clients as well as what we understand when we're looking at integrations, that one thing which Shopify does is very, very seamless and direct integration with all of these platforms, where the uh, information exchange between Shopify as well as these platforms is, uh, is, is fantastic, right? When, you, when you're working with these platforms, with Google, with Meta, 
it's 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 very important to pass on the right kind of signals back to these platforms in order to scale up your campaigns and uh, that uh, integration is beautifully done with Shopify. It's very seamless, it's very easy, and it's very quick. So uh, while you know, may, may have a single interface platform in the future sometime, if Google and Meta agree, like they've come here, uh, agree on providing a single platform, but if till that doesn't happen, I think it's important to ensure that whatever platform you use for your commerce, and in this case Shopify, it does uh, seamless data transfer or seamless signals transfer to these platforms. Uh, so just adding a little bit of a layer on top of that, uh, while you, while like Siddhan said and Shansh built upon that, you know, you have different channels and different platforms where people will continue to advertise on, uh, Shopify, uh, a lot of the reports that come back from all of these merchants do show up on Shopify itself. So the way I see it, a lot of the data that you have at your hand, depending on the kind of Shopify subscription you have, of course, but uh, you have a lot of data at hand to make data-driven decisions uh, purely using the power of Shopify and the reports that Shopify has available. Uh, you know, uh, campaign-wise, UTM-wise, segmentation, and everything else that you could do. And all of that data feeds back into Shopify to let you make data-driven de decisions better. So I, I think uh, w building on what they said, uh, while you'll not have a single platform or so, but uh, there is a hub in place that lets you see all of that data on Shopify itself. And obviously, you could deep dive into those specific platforms to figure out how you could do better. Uh, any other questions? Oh, yeah. This, this is one that is very, very frequent. All of our merchants ask us. When is Shopify? Yeah. So, so the question for uh, Shopify folks is, when is Shop Pay coming to India? I think I hear this every every time I <laughs> am out. Uh, so, uh, I think you know uh, we've. So the idea is to create the best payments experience, right? And I think to a large extent, via our integrations in India, we've been able to do that, right? Like. We're seeing a lot of enhanced checkout, uh, you know, adoption over the last uh, few months, right, uh, in the ecosystem. And I think we've done a good job of, like, in, you know, integrating closely with all the payment partners to ensure that you get the best payment, ex most secure payment experience uh, there. So players like Razorpay, Simple, GoQuick, you know, we have, uh, we're working with them all to enable the best experience there so that you get all the data back into your Shopify platform as well. Uh, and you're able to provide like a seamless enhanced checkout experience to your customers, right? Shop Pay, uh, on the other hand, um, you know, we keep watching every market and, you know, we today are available in 18 countries. So while we are available in 175 countries, Shop Pay is not available everywhere. And I think, uh, you know, uh, that if we had like line of sight, we would have been very happy to share that. Our teams are working though on it, and uh, hopefully uh, we're able to bring it to you all soon. Uh, but at the moment, I don't have an exact time uh, when we'll be launching it. So, so if that happens, we'll be the first to know. I, I, I hope, and uh, we'll uh, transfer that information seamlessly again to you. I think one of the other questions that we had from folks was with respect to Shopify Plus. Uh, a lot of our merchants uh, wonder about when is the right time to graduate from maybe a Shopify uh, to a Shopify Advanced or from an Advanced to a Plus. Uh, while I know that you guys have some sort of you know threshold values in terms of GMVs and revenue numbers, uh, I don't want to get into the specifics of that. But uh, in, ge in general, what would you say is like the tipping point for a merchant to decide to switch over? Like what's major pain, pain point call for the next tier? I think this one, uh, I think it depends on the brand, right? Like where they are in their journey, what are their plans? It's not about, you know, what scale you're at already or I, it's not that simple, right? Like in, in to give you one answer that, hey, you should be doing X amount of uh, scale, you should be doing this, you should be needing. It's a mix of things, right? Uh, we have uh, D2C first brands, you know, who have, uh, you know, big investment that they're about to make in three months and they need a scalable 
solution, best in class, like checkout experience, they pick it up right away, irrespective of what scale they are at right now, right? So, um, uh, but if I was to if I was to put uh, a number, like typically sub five percent of your overall cost, um, sub five percent of your GMV co should be your spend on tech, right? And keep that in mind, right? While you're taking that decision, rest is when you need the features and when you're about to make an investment. Uh, it can, uh, it's a call that you can make. We actually would be very happy to speak to you, anybody who's interested and is considering right after as well, because the answer can be tailor-made and different based on where you are in your journey, right? Uh, sometimes a traditional brand comes to us who has no offline presence, but they want the best solution out of the box, right? Because they're, they're gonna be investing heavily to scale that up right away. So that, that's why I would like to make it a very custom discussion Whoever here wants to chat, we'd be happy to uh, chat more. Yeah. So uh, I think uh, we've taken a lot of time, uh, and we have a few sessions also to uh, follow. But uh, the team is here. Uh, in case you want to have a follow-up conversation with the Shopify team, or at a later point again with Nishit or somebody from our end, uh, so we can help you with those conversations. Thank you so much, Sadan. Thank you, Ayush, uh, for your time. And exciting times, we look forward to the Shopify Future of Commerce report uh, whenever it is out. And we also look forward to when do we, when India gets the chance to move to Shopify Pay. Shop pay. And, and winter editions, the next set of release of products, right? So, yeah. So pretty much uh, towards the end of our sessions today, we've got two uh, quick primers, uh, first with Spotify uh, and then with MyGate. So I think these are very important sessions as we've seen Spotify grow from strength to strength in India. And then uh, after these sessions, we're gonna have a sundowner. So please wait around, there's a little bit of alcohol here and there. So, uh, so let's begin with Spotify. Uh, I'll request Harpreet to join us. Yeah. Sorry, he's just setting up. Give us a minute.
Okay. I know a lot of you are feeling a little sleepy right now. Uh, we're just going to soon end off our session. We are almost about to end. A couple of more sessions to go. But last question is around the same. Uh, one in ten people conceived in Europe are conceived on this company's bed. Yes. IKEA. <laughs> <laughs>
Next, I got Steve Lacey, who hails from Compton. He started his career as a member of the band The Internet. Then in 2017, Steve's first solo track, Dark Red, was added to Spotify's Fresh Finds playlist. Since then, his catalog spans across a range of genres from bedroom pop to rock, and he recently won a Grammy for Best Progressive R&B Album. Here's his breakout hit, Bad Habit. Yeah, That's the level of personalization we're doing. This personalized AI DJ will be your DJ, which can you can actually instruct to play songs and, and uh, bring that personalization to your listening behavior. But what is important for us, uh, we are probably part of your journey and your life every moment that you may think of. So if you are browsing or if you're working on your laptop or a tablet or a smart speaker in your car, we are across everywhere. So any, any hardware that you may think of, Spotify is available there. And that is what what makes us very unique because uh, not just we are available there as a brand or as a marketer, it is available for you to tap upon. And that is where moments and moods and mindsets, which are which are the key aspects of our platform, br bring in a lot more, lot more personalization and a lot more intelligence to your marketing. And like I said, <coughs> there are these moments which are very unique to Spotify because uh, Nielsen also tells you that about 79% of the time when the user is actually interacting with Spotify, they Spotify is actually the companion to them, right? So if you are, say, working out, if you're cooking, if you are uh, having a meal time, these are unique moments where no other platform can actually help you tap upon a user. And that is what we bring on the table. We are not competing against any video platform here or any visual platform. But these moments actually help you stand out because one, these are clutter-free environment for you. Second, these are these are moments which is where the attention is is far more better than than any other platform. If I compare ourselves with any video platform or any visual platform, you're probably taking out some time of your day and then interacting with them. But Spotify helps you across all these moments to, to tap upon and bring in that kind of personalization. Uh, our story in numbers, we've been in India for about uh, almost five years now. We'll be completing our five-year anniversary next month. But as per the latest comm score, we're, we're home to about 70 million monthly active users. Uh, which is by far the largest in terms of digital audio streaming in India. Uh, there are about 200,000 playlists curated every month, sorry, every day. There are about 70,000 local artists that's that's helping us grow much, much deeper in India, and so to say the Bharat. Uh, there are about 5 million podcasts dedicated from India. Uh, over the course of last four years, we've worked with a more than 300 brands and uh, and yeah when we started we were considered or we were perceived as an international platform but today about 70 percent of our streaming is act actually happening on local music and it's not just hindi you can think of any language be it bengali haryanvi whatever all of that stream is actually reflecting on the platform uh, this is what i wanted to tell you this is you see how from december 2021 to december 23 our language streams have grown so you could see English, which, which was the top in 2021, is probably the second or the third language today. Punjabi, Tamil, Telugu, all these languages going very high on the platform, which is where your story for your brand uh, becomes much more relevant because all these cues, if you combine them with our streaming intelligence, which I will take you through uh, in slides to come, uh, will actually add the magic that we want to create. And like I said, uh, 70 million monthly active users as per latest comm score. Uh, what is interesting here and which is the time. Time spent on the platform is more than about two hours uh, per user per day, which is where they stream Spotify when they actually start their day to probably when they end their day. And that is what is unique. So if you add the device story, if you add the moment story, it is something which is very unique. Uh, and we've grown approximately about 100% uh, uh, year on year. And we're still on that trajectory where we we foresee much, much larger growth coming in as we move deeper in the Bharat. Uh, this is our global number. Uh, and just to give you a highlight of what that split looks like from a global point of view when it comes to premium user versus the free user, we are home to about uh, half a billion users, more than half a billion users in, in the world. 
Out of that, about 60% is actually on the free side uh, and about 40% on the paid, which is not the story in India, but uh, I can take that offline question if at all you have anything about uh, India when it comes to paid listeners. But largely, that doesn't change anything from a behavior on the platform. Uh, we see across various studies that we have done, the behavior of uh, free users versus the premium users is almost the same. Uh, this is uh, this is the latest comparison again again on Comscore, which tells you where does Spotify lands across uh, all the other streaming players which are available. So by far we are the market market leaders, and we are building the story for audio streaming in India. Uh, when it comes to our geographic split, uh, we are like I said when we started, we were very urban. We were we were considered to be very up market. Uh, English uh, streaming platform, but that's not the case anymore. We are split across almost healthy in terms of an almost equal share when it comes to the urban market, which is top uh, eight cities, and the rest of India, which is almost contributing 40%. And this number is growing very rapidly because uh, that is where, where the larger growth for everybody in digital today is lying, and as internet grows, uh, that growth is bound to come, come to us. Uh, Spotify is a platform for uh, Gen Zs and Millennials. Almost 70% of our audience actually is residing uh, or is uh, belonging to the age group of 16 to 34, which is where all these uh, audiences, these are the audiences who are today making those purchase decisions, influencing those purchase decisions. So that is something which uh, is more important. And, and uh, even if you slice it down to any age group, that would probably be relevant for your brand. We are almost doing more than 60% across across all of that. So that is the story that we have. Uh, and more so healthy when you compare on the gender split. Uh, average internet audience in terms of gender split today is 75, 25. We are enjoying the almost 60, 40 here. It also translates to a lot of things that you as a brand would look at. So it's a very brand safe environment. It's uh, There is hardly any any UGC on the platform, which is where females or, or uh, audiences across various cuts would, would feel safe about it. And that, if you translate to your story, it's, it, it's probably the most premium content that you are actually writing on. So uh, that's uh, that's on the gender split. But uh, how is Spotify different from any other platform? So if you look at these stats from GWI, it tells you that almost one fifth of our audience are actually cord cutters. They don't subscribe to any cable TV which is where the net new outreach that we help you with. Uh, almost 40% of them are not subscribed to any print media. All, same is the case for radio as well. These audiences, which are Gen Zs and Millennials, they are not, they are not on print, they are not on radio. All, and also on digital per se, uh, almost 53% of them don't subscribe to any s streaming service as well. So almost half of the audience which is lying on Spotify is probably not elsewhere that is, is a net new reach that, that is available to you. Uh, these are again some stats uh, for us to identify our users, what they actually look like, because it's personalized, because we have a lot of indicators about these users uh, who are on the platform. Almost all of Spotify users actually resonate with health and fitness, because if your brand is about, is talking about health, it's talking about fitness and those awareness, almost everybody on the platform is actually talking about or, or resonating with that. Uh, almost 1.2x are actually buying latest tech when when they are actually launched. So, which means any new product launches around tech, Spotify users would be the first one to grab that. Uh, one in three are actually uh, top fashion brand influencers. So these users probably not just uh, purchase your product, but they actually influence others uh, to buy your product. And almost 90% of them are shopping online. Uh, and this is this is the last month stat. So everybody who's there on the platform is actually shopping online. Is probably using plastic money to transact, and that is something which is very important stat for you to take away. Uh, moving on, uh, again on on the affinity of these users, there are almost about 47. Half of these users are actually buying, or or own a house or a property. If that translates to affinity. Uh, that's something for you to take away. Almost one fifth of them have actually purchased a car last year, so which is very interesting because uh, nobody else can actually give you that kind of audience, which is buying maybe a house or a car or all of those. Uh, and they're almost one third of them are taking a vacation, international vacation or domestic vacation, right? Uh, uh, one third of them are actually 
making a major purchase, tech purchase decision this year. So all of these stats help you not just look at Spotify uh, audiences, but look at their behavior as well, which is where uh, this helps you stand out in a way where uh, no other platform can actually deliver. Uh, Digital audio is actually part of everyday listeners. Like I said, uh, it's part of everybody's daily routine. Uh, almost 63% of these participants that the survey took uh, tell that Spotify is very important and very essential part of their, which is what we want as, as a platform. Because these users are coming not just there on the platform, lying on the platform. They are coming back on the platform day in, day out. Maybe maybe identifying or maybe resonating with something that they really love, they, they really like. Uh, and especially around this topic, uh, culture is something which is very relevant. And, and especially when you are looking at an annual level, culture, how do you, how do you plan on a platform like us? Because which is already uh, every day uh, changing. Uh, every day there is a new resonance coming on the platform through culture. Uh, there is a classic example. When uh, COVID struck and people were getting uh, vaccinated, you had tons of these playlists where people were making playlists around songs you should listen to while you are going for a vaccination or while you are coming back from a vaccination. When this Swiss, uh, ship in the Suez Canal actually got stuck, people were making playlists that songs you should lis listen to while you are stuck in the Suez Canal. So all of these are cultural reflection. Uh, whatever happens around the world actually reflects on, on the platform. And I have a few very good case studies where, where uh, this actually reflects. Uh, when Backstreet Boys came to India, we saw about 200% stream uh, uplift of streams on 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 their their music. I had about four digits uh, stream uh, uplift again on uh, playlists related to Barbie, and of course the Barbie official playlist as well. Again, uh, very similar stats across all these all these relevant moments. So anything that happens around the world or something which is trending is actually reflecting on the platform, which is something. Where, when you're planning at a at a at a annual level, look at other platforms. All these people who have who visited uh, here today and yesterday, look at them. Whatever they would probably be doing is actually reflecting on the platform as ours as well. Uh, uh, how your audiences actually tune in? You, we have uh, one. We have obviously the music. Then we have these cultural and social moments, which is across our playlist. So you have playlists across anything that you may think of, right? Right from your viral hits to your getting ready to anything probably on the earth that you may think of, right? Any topic that you may come off. And lastly, the podcast, which is where uh, your passion and interest actually reflect. So we have all these opportunities for you to tap upon to look at probably uh, podcast listeners around entertainment or biz news, business, finance. All of these are indicators for, for much more deeper aspects that you would probably think of while you're planning. Uh, again, from a cultural relevance point of view, I, I have this one audio. If you can play the audio. Sorry, if you can play the audio. Uh, <laughs> this, is a, this is a track. <laughs> This is a track which went viral, right? Of course, it was supposed to come on Spotify. People got obsessed with the song. Uh, it gave birth to a rising pop artist uh, on the platform. Uh, it became the most banging track across all the playlists on Spotify. Uh, we saw the spike in streams, not just in India, but outside of India as well. Uh, obviously, it got the increased visibility on the platform. It was very organic. Uh, it became the India's top 200, uh, number two actually in the top 200 tracks of India at that point of time, right? It became the number one in Spotify global viral charts. Uh, we saw almost 900% growth in just one month on the track, right? So all these are all these are indicators, and you can see that graph how it actually panned out from May to June. Uh, these are the indicators of what is happening around the world. What is happening in the music world is is actually reflecting on on the platform. Uh, what people are actually listening to today. Uh, Filmy is one of the biggest genres for us. We see about 35 million users just listening on Arijit Singh. Arijit Singh was our top rapped artist of the year as well. Uh, 20 million 
player, listeners across Alka Yagnik and Udit Narayan, which is what nostalgic is, is also one of the behaviors that we see on the platform, right? Almost 32 million listeners, uh, uh, AR Rehman Matli listeners actually listen to, uh, same as the case with Anirudh and, and Ilya Raja as well, right? So all these, all these basically tell you that across all these content, across all these behaviors which are there, uh, is reflective uh, on the platform. Uh, we see that across not just on, on uh, genres related to India, but we see that happening across international genres as well. So almost about 32% of K-pop streams are actually coming from 13 to 17. And we are the platform that allow you to target these audiences as well. 45% uh, of these K-pop listeners are actually coming from 18 to 24, which is what Gen Z's are doing. So we have all these indicators for you to tap upon these audiences and look at how, how these, these are growing. This is something which is very interesting. Our indie, uh, indie is one of our biggest growing genres again. Uh, this track became much, much bigger even before it was actually launched otherwise, right? So Rangisari, we saw almost about 100% year-on-year growth as, as it was involved in, the, in a Bollywood movie. Uh, and something which is very important, again, I'm talking about moods, moments, and mindset, which I will cover what it actually means for us. Uh, in the further slides, but almost about if you look at across all these uh, statistics, people or the users on the on the platform are looking at Spotify very differently. They are looking at Spotify, which is bringing their them net net positive outlook. It's not a platform which is which is probably having a news or or giving out hate or about ranting. It's a platform which delivers net outreach. That is why it's very brand safe. It's, it, it delivers the positive outlook to the brands as well. Uh, and we see that relevance across everything uh, on, the, on the platform. Like I said, festive is also one of our, one of our major uh, uplift or the major uh, uplift that we see on the streams as well. So almost about uh, across all these stats that you see, almost 70% growth on, on festive and Diwali uh, when it comes to all these kind of content, right? Uh, I'll just skip through probably to help you understand what Diwali that passed, uh, and I'm sure it will be helpful for you to understand when you're planning around Diwali for this year again. We see almost about 34% increase in uh, getting ready. That is also one of the important uh, moments that we have. Almost 21x increase in party moments, because obviously everybody likes to party when, when it's Diwali, right? Uh, 29x increase in happy moments. Uh, like I said, it's a very happy state environment already on the platform, but we see that high rising when, when there is there is festivities around. Uh, we see that happening across various devices as well. Uh, and I would like to tell you this very classic example that I always quote is that any platform in India can actually tell you that here is Harpreet, who is in the age group of 18 to 40, is probably residing in a metro city, is using an iPhone, but that's that, right? They would probably use a third party to tell you, okay, he's a fitness enthusiast. But we as a platform can tell you, okay, he's a fitness enthusiast and is out there running at this point of time, right? Because we know much, much deeper about them. If you combine, and the cue is for us is that if you are a user listening to Spotify 7 a.m. early in the morning, uh, listening to a very high tempo music, and that track is part of a, one of our fitness playlist, and your Spotify is connected to a headphone, obviously it translates to that. Yeah, sure. Uh, just skipping through, as a platform, we help you uh, target all of these, uh, all of these across all these uh, platforms. So from, an, from a device to anything, any hardware that you would probably look at. Uh, moods, moments, and mindset, which is something very interesting to our platform, which is which is what drives relevance, right? Mood for us is uh, you are listening to a happy, you are listening to a sad music. There is different kind of music that you listen to. Moments for us is you are into workout, you are in party, you are getting ready. All these are moments for us. And mindsets are you are in a discovery mindset. You are listening to probably one of our discovery playlists, right? You just want your Spotify to tune into new music that you would want to listen to or nostalgic. You just want to go back into the era which you loved. So all of that, if you tap that into a brand story, uh, say it's a launch and you want your brand to be discovered, discovery is the mindset for you to tap upon, right? So all of that, these are the cues for you to help upon. 
and like i said across all these uh, moods moments and there are tons of tons of these that that uh, we can help you tap upon if you combine all of these with the device story with the platform and with the creative story it actually gives you a very very magical uh, output i'll just skip through because i know all of these are first party segments that we have and just in interest of time i have lot to cover so i'm skipping through some of the important slides but as a platform you can use us for everything around the top funnel what we solve for uh, we solve for the best we don't solve for the bottom funnel but like i said we solve the top funnel i think the best in the class uh, so across branding increasing consideration product launches we have uh, opportunities and options uh, around all these uh, uh objectives uh we have uh, our i'm delving into our formats but just in interest of time we have the first one is is audio which is obviously no brainer uh we call it as audio everywhere because it's audio is the only format that cuts across all sorts of devices uh that is available so you may think of a smart watch to a gaming console to everything uh audio is the is the format for you but we have uh, i would and then obviously around audio you could do a lot of things something which is uh, a 3d audio which uh, takes the user into the into the moment uh, and sorry i'm just rushing through because of time but uh, we have something called dynamic audio as well which is where think of the fact that you were to create 10000 personalized cre creatives for for a set of audience right it's practically not possible dynamic audio what it does is that based upon the certain cues of of the user it can actually customize your creative right on the fly so you don't need to probably create everything you just need to fix your constants and your variables on the creative and everything the system does for you so uh, a classic example for that is say if you are a dyson air purifier and you want to showcase different creatives for different people at the same time in say delhi and bombay based on the aqi which is outside you can tell a user in delhi that hey your aqi outside is say 500 it's probably time for you to switch to dyson air purifier versus somebody in in bombay where the AQ, aqi is probably good uh, you can just showcase any other uh, feature of the air purifier that maybe call out that you can still use your dyson air purifier as a room freshener or something right so lot of lot of uh, use cases can be built uh, it's just how you use these uh, i'm just skipping through there is a classic case study that i want to showcase around dynamic audio sorry anish you have to allow me <laughs> personality is limitless you can go from tinkering with the latest tech to taking the wheel in a classic car your personality is limitless you can go from sweaty workouts and weights to supporting a suit behind your screen the many angles of your personality is precisely the thing that makes you you sorry i'll just skip hello i'll just skip through uh, <laughs> i have a lot of lot more to cover uh, we are not just an audio platform we are a multi format platform uh, our video product is hands down one of the best in class uh, we hope for the fact that we only showcase video ad to users when they are on the screen which also brings in lot of efficiency in your planning uh, our system knows when the user is is glued to the app on the foreground 
and that's when we only trigger the video ads. Uh, why I'm saying this is best in class because one, it obviously solves for that. Second is that our impression pixels on uh, video only fires at the last second of the creative, which means in a way you're delivering a, a complete view to the user. Uh, and so is our uh, display. It again fires when the user is on the screen. It's more like a welcome back message. Uh, uh, something which is which is the currency on the platform, which is sponsored playlist. It helps you give or provide you with uh, additional outreach against a context. So if you are, say, probably sponsoring a playlist around fitness and want to reach out to fitness enthusiasts, with the inventory, you can reach out to just limited set of users. But if you are sponsoring a playlist around fitness, it actually adds a lot of value to your overall campaign. If you have a classic example of what brands are doing on the platform and this is probably one of our best case studies so far. Uh, this is for IKEA and I would love let you to actually see it. Ambient noise playlists on Spotify are a gift to parents for getting baby to sleep. But if you're one of the 156 million people who don't have Spotify premium, this happens. What's that? Are you ready for it? Stop selling so loud. Everyone is getting mad. IKEA cares about sleep. So we found the most popular baby sleep playlist on Spotify and bought targeted ads at times when babies are sleeping. So for an entire month, we replaced loud, silly, wake the baby ads with shushy, snoozy ads like this. And I'm whispering, so your baby can sleep. So soothing. Not loud Sally kitchen ads. Why do they make me yell all the time? And while baby was still sleeping like a baby, we had some really quiet messages for parents that were still awake. But you're still up. What a pain in the neck. You know how to deal with the pain in the neck. Ergonomic pillow. Don't mind me. Get the mattress from IKEA. And all these better sleep things away. Our sushi ads helped babies stay asleep and were also very clicky. At IKEA, we don't just sell you beds, we help you sleep in them too. Yep. So that's what Playlist actually does. Uh, I'm being stared again again, but I'll just skip through a couple of slides to give you what it does. So it gives you a uh, real estate on the on the playlist, which is already available. So there is already a lot of set of users who are coming in day in, day out. So it gives you that kind of visibility. Uh, we also have a property called Branded Playlist and a Branded Profile. It's basically a real estate or a sonic identity on the platform, just like you would do probably a YouTube page or a Facebook page. Uh, it's just very simple, but uh, it's new kid on the block, and uh, it's bound to give you the kind of results that you would probably seek. Uh, then we have, like I said, there are a lot of multi-format op opportunities. We are also getting into, I'm just skipping through, sorry. Uh, this is again one, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, we are also getting into a lot of, lot of other aspects of the business. This is the newest case study that we have with Royal Enfield, and I'll just take two minutes more, sorry. <laughs> oh. OK, sorry. Uh, so I'll just probably play this and then, and then skip through, right? Oh my, king of the jungle, I stand for the pride You can try, but I won't stop, won't stop Won't stop Won't stop Won't stop You can try, but I won't stop, won't stop Sorry, just in interest of time, Rap 91 is our biggest hip-hop playlist, which we brought on ground last year, uh, actually in 2022. 2023, we got Royal Enfield to be partner, partnering into it and bringing all the, all the, 
or around the online space to to the on ground space where they actually launched uh, on the on ground event they launched the new bike that they had uh, but yeah again on podcast uh, but yeah that brings me to the last slide uh, we are here uh, let us know how we can solve for anything that you may have at this point of time and obviously uh, anything on on the earth that you would probably be working upon i am pretty much sure if it is on the top funnel we'll solve for the best around it thank you thank you armi for this uh, lovely presentation so this brings to our last uh, session by my gate it will be a 15 minute session yes and then uh, we'll start with a sundowner party for everybody Hello, am I audible? Hello, am I audible till the end? Yes. Perfect. Good evening, everyone. Is everyone awake? Good evening. Can I get a reply, please? Yes. Perfect. So, hi everyone. I am Srishti uh, from MyGate. I have Sanket as well with me, my teammate. and i take care of strategic partnership and alliances for brands right with my gate um, i would like to thank uh, you know uh, lixil and semingo for inviting us here and just to start with my gate i uh, have just two questions quickly if somebody can answer that i mean sorry like a poll how many of you are staying in gated communities just raise your hands and how many of you have used my gate as an application perfect so my job is done i think okay so my gate the bet, the gateway to better living right um how we started so my gate started in 20, 2016 right and uh, and this was to kind of uh, you know address a gap between the security system in the in the gated communities right uh while i talk about the reason now there were two macro trends that we saw one was that more people were shifting to the gated communities right and the other was that the rising of e-commerce in india right like swiggy ola uh, you know zomato and so more and what we offered was the visitor management um, internal communication help desk amenity management and so on and so forth right and hence today we have 25000 communities 3.5 million homes and we are present in more than 27 cities and we are a one stop solution for all the community engagement uh, you know amenity so for example manage uh, manage visitor and delivery uh, approvals right parking and vehicle management uh, from booking the amenities then make utility uh, payment bills like uh, electricity bills and the maintenance bills right uh, moving ahead now what kind of audience do we have we have 100% nccs aa plus families right we have 30 to 70 ratio which is basically using ios versus android phones right and 73% are these four uh, four wheeler owners right and 63% are uh, you know 63% Mike as a ads platform why did we started it so one of the reason is that during covid we realized that uh, you know the brands wants to reach out to the residents right and uh, and and there have been very limited media available at that moment of time 
and they were very less consumer you know retention as well and that's when you know lot of brands reach out to our founders and said can you please help us in getting inside the inside the societies right and uh, swiggy instamart was our first brand wherein we onboarded them for the sales right in terms of their uh, ad sales now there in they were actually uh, you know the so i'll just take you through the case study post this uh, now today my gate ad platform is actually catering is used by 25000 plus brands right to communicate their uh, advertisements and wherein we are leveraging 1.2 billion annual uh, you know visitor entries uh, 100 million uh, plus ecom deliveries is something that we have seen annually right and 5 lakh household items have been listed right um, this is one of the case study uh, just to give you an example uh, of the you know of, of swiggy instamart so basically we all know about swiggy but when instamart was launched we are uh, nobody was aware of it and uh, that's when they came to us saying that you know we wanted to brand building of swiggy instamart the overall launch of it right wherein people can get within 10 to 15 minutes they can get their uh, you know grocery at their doorstep right and hence how we did it was it was a 360 degree integrated communication that we did we did in in app uh, you know banners right we did we, we ran, we ran uh, you know couple of contest for them and along with that we also did some offline campaign for them right which was uh, signages and the door uh, and the door taggings right and hence what we helped them for is reaching out to 6000 plus communities right in 6 months their market share reached to 30% right moving ahead now why migrate why migrate in your media why migrate in your aop plans right so one is the target audience right i'm going to i'm going to spend a lot of time here major time because uh, this is where uh, you know we are we are here to discuss about so um, you know this so the target audience is basically the decision maker we don't have a segregation of uh, you know how many women are using the application or how many men are using how many kids so here they are the decision maker of a household right they have the complete control of who is coming in their household and and they're managing the complete household through our application right now i talk about high frequency and high recall now here uh, since they have been coming to the application multiple times for their multiple usages hence your ad is visible to them for multiple times and hence these are all consumed in a way while they're engaged with the application it's not something that's been bombarded and that's what the next point also co covers is the native ads every ad i mean i would say every brand when it comes to uh, advertising they need to reach out to these households the residents of these households right and that's where we come into the picture uh, and the best part is that this is being used while uh, you know they are using the application hence it is not really disrupting so for example you enter the society you see a gate signage right you are anyways getting inside the society it's not bothering you you interested you look at it if you're not interested you move ahead you you get inside the lift for lift you see a lift poster right similarly when you are in the home you are approving a uh, you know maybe a delivery is there at the doorstep right and you are simply just seeing a ad if you're interested you'll engage with it right and here we have seen that the consumers are more involved when it comes to advertising on our application 360 degree digital integrations now here we can help you not just with the online presence on the application but also with the offline uh, part as well so we have done couple of uh, you know communication uh, you know ads with the brands wherein we have stitched both of it right and i'll take you through a couple of case studies there uh, and the last is the business growth and expansion now here this is very interesting and very important thing that you know we are not just helping in terms of the media plan but we are just a step ahead right now for example with uh, you know so with dominos we ran two months uh, you know pilot campaign and now we are uh, helping them in with the low index area so wherein they have less uh, you know dominos deliveries or we have more pizzas ordered but not dominos right we are helping them identify those areas and that's where we have, they have identified that around 60% of uh, you know uh, they have seen a 60% growth in their business right and they are also planning to open stores wherever they are not present but the orders of pizzas are coming into the picture right so basically we have the database of especially for in, for ecom right now for example spencers they are saying that you help us where the major of majority of blinkit and uh, you know all these orders are happening and we probably will open our stores in and around so this is not just related to your media planning but this is expanding and growing your business further as well right uh, 
Now going to the next slide, our advertising format. So one is spotlight, when you open the application, the first tile expands, right? So coming into the limelight while somebody is just opening the application. Second is approval cards while you're approving or denying anyone's entry. That's where you look at uh, one of the uh, you know approval card advertisement. Then in feed, like you scroll your LinkedIn or Facebook, right? A lot of posts. That's where that's how the, uh, the that's how the community is actually engaging with each other, the, the residents, right? So for example, I have started my baking classes. Uh, I would post it, and hence somebody else will post that I'm I'm looking out for say uh, you know a, a buyer of my second hand car, right? So, and, and that's where the ad can also be placed, right? Now, if you see that there's no disruption, the, the uh, you know, basically the, the, the resident is not getting bothered with the advertisement. And proud to say that we hardly have 0.5% who are subscribed for a premium subscription that is no ad, uh, you know, display. And the, this is, now this is, uh, so before this it was more about the mass media, this is about hyperlocal. Now, a lot of brands who say that, you know, I'm not present pan India. I'm not present probably complete city, but I want to target specific areas. That's where this comes into the picture. This is a digital notice board. This comes with multiple formats meeting your objective. It could be a lead generation, it could be a video, it can be a brand web page redirection, or it could be interstitial, which works like a carousel, right? Now coming to offline, we have sampling, we have signages, uh, we can do food truck, we can do kiosks, we can do lift posters, and whatnot. Anything related to societies, we have a good repo with them, and we can make it happen. Just that we have to do the feasibility, and we'll make it happen for you. Couple of case studies. Um, so for Wakefit, basically they wanted more footfalls to their stores, right? And how we helped them was, we, we did a digital pulse, the last property that I showed you, and what we were doing is we were redirecting them to their WhatsApp chat. And that's where we saw that 2.5% CTR was there. Along with that, we have seen 40,000 uh, you know, conversations happening on the WhatsApp, right? And they were shared a unique code, which they can go and utilize it at their uh, particular store, right? Uh, Blinkit, so they started with Kiosk, wherein they were delivering free br uh, breakfast items. And then gradually, they went to the uh, digital banners, wherein we, we did somewhere around six, uh, 600 kiosk in a month. And the CTS on the digital, we have seen somewhere around 1.45. Mintra, they, 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 they were, uh, you know, they ran a brand awareness, uh, basically awareness kind of a, uh, you know, uh, campaign for a big fashion festival, right, which was to kind of increase their, uh, you know, traffic at their website during the sale. And we have seen, and this was done Pan India, and we have seen somewhere around 1.9% CTR, right. Coming to Flipkart, they wanted more uh, signups on the VIP, uh, you know, memberships, and hence we ran certain banners and native feed for them, wherein we saw somewhere on 2.5% CTR, Pan India again. This is the last case study. So <laughs> this is something that we did for MG, wherein we did somewhere around 150 car displays, and they got 500 test drives. Right, at the society. So this was again a mix of digital pulse to kind of create a hype and to get them leads. At the same time, uh, you know, connected with the car display which was there, physically there at their society. So they just had to come down and take a test drive. These are a couple of brands that we worked with across categories. Like I said, we are, we can cater to every kind of, uh, you know, industry possible, right? And that's it. Let's engage with community. Thank you so much, everyone. Open for questions, and I hope I did not take much time. <laughs> and we are here. You can interact with us, and we can probably take it ahead. Thank you. Hi. So, so thank you everyone for your patience and uh, you know listening through all the insights from various publishers. I thank all the publishers for uh, being an important part of the event. Um, for any conversations that you want to have with any publisher or any insights that you need 
or if you need our help with anything, please reach out to us and we'll be very happy to help you. Um, we now have uh, the bar getting open in about five minutes and uh, we also have some evening snacks. So we'll just begin the sundown in about five, ten minutes. Uh, in this time, if you want to speak with any of the representatives of uh, publishers, we've got the Google uh, team still here. We've got Spotify, we've got MyGate. So feel free to reach out to them and we can have a chat. Okay, so in five minutes, we'll open up the bar. Thank you. Thank you.